Howdy, howdy. Good Hello. Morning. We <laughs> have a special guest today. It's awesome to introduce you guys to uh, Leslie Keith. Uh, so she's, I guess you're a lymphatic system specialist, you should say. <laughs> go ahead and I don't know your uh, your accolades, but if you wanted That's to go okay. ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm, a, I'm an occupational therapist, and I got a doctorate in occupational therapy to focus on obesity and lymphedema specifically, um, and um, ran a little pilot study about using a ketogenic diet to help people who were obese and had lymphedema. And that was in 2015, but boy, I've learned so much more since then. Uh, it's pretty exciting. The CLT means Certified Lymphedema Therapist. Um, so I, I've been spending a lot, almost 25 years treating lymphedema, lymphedema, and other lymphatic disorders. So okay, excited so to talk to you today. <laughs> yeah, it's something we've all been struggling for many, many years and just had no answers. So this is exciting. Yeah. Well, sure. and so I, many I, people in the audience are, are excited too, because this is by far, you know, not even a close second. This is the most questions that we have. It's about uh, the lymphatic system, lymphedema, lipedema, and people are lost on it, you know. Mm -hmm. And I have my, my own theories that are, are starting to be more accepted in the uh, lymphatic community. Um, and um, some that are just things that I've just come to question um, more recently um, because I've been really focusing on the lymphatics of the trunk and what happens in the trunk. Um, but one thing that I have noticed, uh, even though the low carb or the carbohydrate restriction or the keto or the carnivore community, even though they don't know anything about the lymphatics, they are so welcome, welcoming to discussing the lymphatics and knowing how this, learning how this interacts with people that are having difficulty with uh, weight and other conditions. Um, so um, not so much in the, the lymphology community, <laughs> even though there are now a lot of great studies out there that are demonstrating what you all are talking about. Um, but, uh, it's becoming more accepted, but they still think I'm an oddball. <laughs> but in, in your community, very welcoming and uh, interested to start to, to learn more about the lymphatics. I think it's good to be an oddball anymore because uh, the mainstream, you know, I say this and with all due respect, but the mainstream's had the football for a long time. And people are getting exponentially sicker under the yes. under this accepted just you know treat their symptoms give them a drug push them out the door and you know load the next you know sick person in like like i think uh thank god we're not settling for that anymore like right. nobody's nobody there nothing nobody's getting healed everything's you know there's a metabolic epidemic crisis as far as i'm concerned that nobody is really addressing but but it's great to kind of see this movement people are doing it on their own you know mm -hmm. They're yes. no longer being fear mongered and saying, you know, believe in all this nonsense that, yes. you know, you know, be scared of fat, <laughs> don't eat meat uh, mm -hmm. and take drugs, you know, like everybody's finally pushing back on that narrative, you know, which I'm very happy to see, you know, yeah. but um, um, one thing that I found is that uh, the people, um, the, the patients, not so much the clinicians and the researchers, but the patients that are, are lymphatic patients, they have lymphedema and or lipedema. Um, when you say, well, this might work, why don't you give it a try? Even without any guidance, they're trying it and it's working. Um, you know, when I, I first met Catherine Sayo from the Lipedema Project in uh, 20, I think it was 2016, 2015, when I was presenting the results of my little tiny pilot study, we were at an NIH conference on the lymphatics. And I said, it works really great with, with lymphedema. And she said, wow, do you think it would work with lipedema too? Because it had never been studied at that point. And, and we just said, I think so. I think it might work. We should try it. And, and we just put it out to the community. We said, hey, this is what Eric Westman uses at Duke University Keto Clinic. Um, 
I don't know, maybe it'll work. Uh, and people, uh, probably about three to six months later, people were posting on Facebook, hey, I've just lost 50 pounds or whatever. I mean, and they had never lost anything before. So uh, people are willing to try, they're willing to self experiment. And then, you know, when your pain is halved or completely resolves, you're going, I'm going to keep doing this. Your doctor's telling you, though, you're going to kill yourself eating this way. But when your pain goes down, you're going, ah, no, I, I think I'm on the right track. I think I'm going to, to keep doing this. And it, it's working. It is. Yeah. yeah. So can you tell us a little bit more about the difference? What is lipedema? What's lymphedema? Right. And the lymphatic system, maybe talk about that. Sure, sure. So lymphedema, we'll start with that one. Um, it's a little bit more recognized lymphedema and it is a, there is some kind of impairment um, in the lymphatic system and it could be that you were born with it or you had some kind of procedure or trauma that um, destroyed or impaired part of your lymphatic system. Most typically people think of it as uh, you had uh, treatment for cancer and they removed lymph nodes they give you radiation treatment and it destroys some more lymph nodes and some lymph vessels. And so now you've got an obstruction in your lymphatics and fluid can't get out of a body area. So it just backs up and collects in that body area. But you could also be born with an imperfectly formed lymphatic system. So you could, it could present right at birth or a lot of times at puberty is when it starts to really uh, show that, that you don't have your lymphatics like you should. So body parts start becoming uh, swollen at that point. And so there is a treatment we do for that. It involves massage, compression, bandaging, exercise, gentle exercise, just to make the um, muscles contract and pump the fluid. And you wear compression garments um, to try to manage it after that. So, Lymphedema um, really starts with a fluid problem, but stagnant fluid actually causes fat proliferation. So someone could have just a normal amount of body fat everywhere, except wherever they have the swelling in their arm or their leg, typically it, it, the fluid gradually gets replaced by fat. And so now you try to do uh, typical treatments of the massage and the compression and the exercise, and it doesn't go down very far because you can't squeeze fat out. But one thing that I found in my study with doing a ketogenic diet with people who had obesity and uh, lymphedema, that the fat in that body area that has the stagnant fluid does go down with this way of eating. You end up um, breaking down fat everywhere in your body um, because you're trying, you're changing into using fat for fuel instead of, instead of uh, glucose and, and sugar and carbs. So it does work for that. And so interestingly, what happens in lipedema is that it starts with fat. So, it, and this is pretty much 99% females. And so when um, a woman, a woman gets lipedema, she starts proliferating fat specifically in her lower body. And that excessive fat actually attracts fluid. Sometimes she can actually be diagnosed with lymphedema on top of the lymphedema, but it attracts fluid. It's excessively painful. Um, and it's all in that lower body. And now we're seeing it also happen in the arms, but typically not in the trunk, head and neck until there's also some obesity and I think some lymphatic dysfunction in the trunk as well that's causing fluid to proliferate there. But you might see a woman who has a very, um, it looks like two different bodies. Her trunk is one size and the lower body is another size, quite a bit larger. So uh, in that case, you start with fat, it, it then causes um, uh, fluid collection. It can't get out of that area. And that um, also um, makes it even harder for the fat to get out. Um, in both of these cases, um, there was an excellent paper that came out oh, about two years ago, Tales of Fluid, Fat, and Fibrosis. And it talks specifically comparing lymphedema and lipedema because they both have those three components. But lymphedema starts with excessive fluid and lipedema starts with excessive fat. 
So um, we, we treat them, the standard conservative way of treating them is basically with um, that, that massage and the compression and the exercise, but nothing was ever done diet wise. The lymphology community did not want to talk about diet and, and women with uh, lipedema were very discouraged because they've already done the um, eat less, move more, low calorie, low fat. And all they did was lose the fat on their head, neck and trunk. The lipedema areas on their body didn't change at all. And now they're even more dis disproportionate. So and the, and the pain stayed and, and all those other symptoms stayed. And so that was, you know, they're pretty despondent and going, I, I can't do anything about this. So now pretty exciting because we just put it out to the community. Give this a try. It might work. So, And they tried it. And I'm so excited that people were willing to try it and, and were able to discover it. And now we're, this was in oh, 2015 or so, 2016 or so. So we've, we kind of have quite a few years of, of trying it. And now we're, we're kind of getting to the nuances and kind of tweaking it and, and kind of seeing for this set of people, it might work good to not have any artificial sweeteners. This set of people, it might be better to go all carnivore, all animal sourced foods. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing what works best individually, but under that umbrella of carbohydrate restriction. Um, and now, especially with lipedema, because they, they don't have an animal model of that condition, there's been studies, uh, studies on people and not just mice. So, um, and, and all those studies are showing that of any diet ever used on lipedema, this is the one that works and the other ones don't. So, um, so even with those fabulous studies, and there's probably at least a half a dozen of them out there, as well as case study reports and stuff like that. Even with that, people are still resistant, right? And I know you guys have seen that even with your amazing transformations. They're going, oh, yeah, but you're killing yourself. <laughs> yeah. It was yeah. killing myself before. Yeah. yeah, well, that's just the thing. I mean, we answer that back, but Lindy makes the greatest point. It's like, yeah, but we wouldn't be alive right now to kill ourselves with this diet <laughs> if we hadn't done it. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. it's, it's just the truth. Now, I heard you say something that really piqued my interest on when you were doing your interview with uh, Adam at Carnivore Today, and you said that, insulin resistance can cause a lymphatic issue or, or cause lymphedema, right? Yes, yes. It, so interestingly, insulin resistance increases your fluid load. So say you've already got excessive fluid and now you also have insulin resistance, you're going to increase that fluid load. So you have even more fluid that you have to get rid of that your lymphatic system is already overwhelmed. It's yeah. already leaving it behind. So, yes. And so what causes insulin resistance? Eating carbs, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and carbs are all plants. <laughs> so you decrease eating that and you can do something about your insulin resistance and then do something about your lymphedema, right? Right. And that's what drives me crazy about the standard American diet and diet, you know, dietitian diet, you know, information they'd have you to lose weight. They don't directly tell you to eat a bunch of carbs, but they tell you don't eat red meat, <laughs> don't eat fat, don't eat, they can tell you all the don'ts. Right, right. And all, but all that's left is the carbs. And well, and, and they do sell you to eat plants because they always say eat lots of fruits and yeah, vegetables, right. true. whole grains. I mean, if, if any food is not meant for humans, it's grains. Okay. And, Boy, and so that is. And, and they refuse to go back on that advice. The more you discuss it, the more they double down on it. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and, you know, reading Jason Fung's literature and stuff, and he talks about, you know, how we have an epidemic of obese, like six month old babies now, you know, yeah. being born. Yeah. And they should be eating less and moving more. Yeah. Right. And, uh -huh. and, and <laughs> insulin resistant, right. You know, cause yeah. I think yeah. he believes that it's from insulin resistance in the womb you know, yeah. insulin's not transferable through the, you know, to the baby, but the glucose levels are. And so it's a little right. poor baby pancreas is yes. dealing with that high, yeah. crazy level of glucose. So we're having babies come out, boom, insulin resistant, which yes. that, which I think was my problem because I was big from the time I was born. Yes. 
but and then I tracked that down too. I'm the youngest of six kids, but I'm by far the heaviest. But mm-hmm. as my mom's diet got worse and got more sugar, yeah. I'm sure she had gestational diabetes. Yeah, all the kids got bigger, right? Yeah, yes. and I was I was the uh, the the prize winner there. But you know, it just everybody got so huge, and I was like, well, clearly this is a direct link to mom's diet and that yeah. diabetes and what was happening to to us in the womb. And then when we came out, we are a direct representation almost. If you did a pie chart, mm-hmm. <laughs> what sugar mom was eating, mm-hmm. it would correspond with the size of me and my brothers, you know, mm-hmm. and siblings mm-hmm. as mom's diet got worse. And so mm-hmm. I was like, I, I like I could literally see in my own family, <laughs> Jason Fung's theory on that playing yes. out. And I was like, yes. holy cow, that's real, yes. you know? Yes. And then and, and here, the more here. that, that um, and the, the larger that you get, the more fat that proliferates is causing more fluid to pool, partly because of the insulin resistance and the other part, just because we don't have good circulation with all the excessive fat. So now we're getting more fluid to pool. That's telling more fl- fat to be produced. Um, and so now it's um, it's causing this, this snowball effect of, of getting you larger and larger with a whole ton of extra fluid and now we're damaging the lymphatic system and my new theory is that we're actually damaging the lymphatics in the trunk and that trunk is now we're we're leaking out of that lymphatic system it should be transporting and taking the fluid out of the tissues and getting it to where to the blood circulatory system but instead it's leaking into the trunk and it's going to go to that lowest point the the lower point of your belly and it's actually going to stretch that skin out and it's going to contribute to forming that apron that can stretch. Well, some people have it down to their knees, just the weight of that fluid causing more fat to collect. Come on in, join the, the party here. And that just stretches the skin out. So you have uh, it's, it's like, what can you do now? How do you stop that from that that cycle um, from uh, yep. proliferating unless you change how you eat and you cut out the carbs, you cut out the plants, a lot of the plants. Right. Well, and then that brings me to another question. I'm getting very excited to get skin reduction surgery, yes. not because I'm going to look better, but because I will stop being this camel reserve for fluid. You yes, yes, yes. You know? you, you, you're, you're just this res- reservoir waiting to fill up. Yeah. Um, so yes, I, I think that it, it is medically necessary that when you, however you lost the weight, if you have a lot of redundant skin, maybe you have really, um, you've had some lobules on the, particularly the, the medial thigh, um, and then that, that uh, belly that made that apron, you lose a lot of that weight. Maybe you did it with carnivore. Maybe you did it with bariatric surgery, but now you've got all that excess skin that wants to refill first with fluid not with fat, you're going to fill it up with fluid. And, um, and so it's medically necessary. That is, it's, it's an infection waiting to happen. I don't know. Have any of you been in the hospital because of like cellulitis infection in those areas? Many times. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's life threatening. So this is medically necessary and absolutely should be covered. This is not cosmetic. It will definitely I'm sure, I'm sure it will have you make you look better, but it is at first, this is medically necessary. I usually get cellulitis two times a year. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. And, and that's been going on for, yes. yeah, and then I'm, I'm building up resistance to all the antibiotics. Yes. And they, they find it harder to, to treat it each time. Yes. Yep. And that's been going on now for 20 mm-hmm. years. And then you're in the hospital and they're putting you an IV. Yes. And what's in that IV? And you're never the same afterwards. Yeah, yeah. They put you on dextrose or something like that. So uh, so uh, my uh, boyfriend, who eats carnivore as well, in the hospital for a planned procedure, they <clears throat> he's, so you know he's super low carb. Then you stick him with a, an IV that has dextrose in it. It shot his blood pressure through the roof, and they wouldn't discharge him because his blood pressure was up. And they're giving him blood pressure medicine. As soon as we figured out there was dextrose in there, and we had him switch to a saline only, all of a sudden the the blood pressure goes right down. So so anybody who ends up, and and now you're in the hospital because you have cellulitis. You are very, very, very ill. How are you going to tell them 
don't give me dextrose. I mean, you, you, and you, it's expected you have to direct it. You know, right. how can you do that when you're you so can't sick? even think straight when you got a hundred and five yeah. fever? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that and that's actually. It's funny that you said that because I literally just heard a story that echoed that exact thing with another carnivore I know. She got mm -hmm. sick, was in the hospital, and uh, they gave her dextrose. And her husband, they couldn't figure out what was wrong, and she was getting like deathly ill. Yes. Yeah, uh, uh, and they had to take her off of it. Her husband advocated, got it off, and her uh, her uh, blood pressure finally dropped once yes. they took off the IV. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it, 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 it's supposed to be a place where you're supposed to be cared for and, and get healthy, but it, it is particularly dangerous for someone like us who is a carnivore because um, we can't take that sudden onslaught of glucose that we haven't been using, you know, than, than, and getting from external sources. It, it really uh, throws us for a loop. And so um, Michael with twice a year being in the hospital, I am impressed on how how well you are doing because that was a dangerous situation. Well, yeah, for sure. Um, let's see. I know we got a bunch of really cool slides to get to and stuff that uh, are going to help a lot. But I also, so we put this in the SBG group and uh, the Meat Sisters group and uh, kind of put it out. And we have a bunch of questions. Plus, we have looks like seventeen questions in the chat already too. All right, right. So, so we got. What I would like to do is give everybody you know, talk about the, the condition that I think is happening in the trunk. Um, and then um, I want to get to what you can do about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, because I, I'm sure that um, that is, is really what we need to do. And it's uh, well, let's, let's just start with that first slide, Michael, that um, shows the flow in the trunk. And so um what you can see down there, this is the lymphatic system when it's showing that flow and then down the very bottom, that's coming out of your legs. And people just tend to think about, oh yeah, I got swollen legs and it's kind of come out of my legs and go into my belly and my trunk through those tubes. Um, but they really forget about all the other contributions to that fluid load that is happening in the trunk. Most of our fluid comes from the liver you can see that in the lower left, the intestines coming on, on the, the lower right, and the lungs. That is the greatest contribution to all that fluid. And what happens is we, when we have a huge amount of fluid um, coming up from the legs and in the, the abdominal area, it backs up into those organs. So now you've got a GI issue, your liver isn't functioning right, you can't breathe. When you can't, you, when you have fluid going the wrong way into those organs, you really affect the organ uh, function. And so our objective is to get it into those tubes, into that main one you see go right behind the heart right there. And then we, you can see that blue line at the, there's a blue line on the right and left side. Yes, right there. That's the subclavian vein on the right and left side. It's going into the blood at that point. And so we're, we're taking it away from the legs and the, uh, all the organs, of course, not shown is the arms and the head, and the neck, but it's all getting into that thoracic duct, that main tube that lies right against your spine. And it's got to get into um, in the blood circulatory system, but locks can go wrong <laughs> before we get to that place. And when it doesn't go to that place, it can leak into your abdominal cavity and contribute to that big belly and the, the apron, it can go back to your organs and cause organ dysfunction. Wow. Um, let's, look at, let's look at the next slide, um, Michael. So how does it happen in the first place? And again, you could be born with a problem. That's that congenital lymphatic malformation. You could be born with not only a problem in your arms and legs, but in your trunk, in your head and neck. Um, but there's also lots of ways you can, your thoracic duct, that main tube up the middle can get injured. It can be any, um, people get it from heart surgery. You know, the, the lymphatic fluid for the most part is clear. The surgeons aren't seeing it. They can easily nick these vessels and cause a leak into the, um, into the chest cavity or in, in the abdominal cavity. So um, any surgery a lot of times you will get post-surgical swelling, right? You have a knee replacement and your knee gets really huge. 
So, but the lymphatics are really good. They, they can heal and guess what they need to heal? Fat. They are healed by fat. So, um, so we need that, but um, the, the lymphatics are your main transport of fat coming out of the intestines. So you need, you know, essential fatty acids. They got to, so they got to be collected by the lymphatics and moved out. And so, um, so you can imagine what happens if you have an, an issue and we're backing up into these organs. I'm not getting my essential fatty acids. They've just gone the wrong way. So you now I, I, how can my lymphatics heal themselves if they don't have this um, lovely fat that helps you know what's, them? You know what's so crazy about what you just said there about you're not getting the essential fatty acids? Mm -hmm. is me and Lindy and a few people at the SBG who took uh, as an experiment did amino acid therapy. Oh, we were yeah. taking a ton of amino acids. When we did, we started moving fluid like crazy. Both yeah. me and Lindy did. Yes. And yes. so, and particularly if your um, lymphatics and your trunk have been damaged, we want to have our essential fatty acids, but we don't, we can't have really high fat because your lymphatics are not able to transport that. So we got to, we got to go a little easy on them and we're going to be lower fat and higher protein. And wow, did you guys do something wonderful when you did mostly protein, you, you gave yourself enough of fat but you didn't go excessive with fat. And now your um, lymphatics were able to heal. That probably will change. You know, there will probably be a point where you can have more fat and you'll be okay. But when, you're, when your intestinal lymphatics are not working, you can't actually eat a, a high fat carnivore diet. I got to ask you something then, because this just happened to me and this really interests me. So for the first uh, 13 or 14 months of carnivore, Yes, I was eating lower, lower fat, higher protein. Yes. And I was doing fantastic. Yes. Then I hit a, a stall that wasn't working anymore. Right now, I'm currently eating more of a traditional. I'm eating two grams of fat per one gram of protein, but everything has come way down. I'm eating far less of mm -hmm. anything. So you but, healed in that time and it was necessary for you to change. Okay. I, you made a really, and I've, I've talked to other uh, people in, in your situation where you're, you're very large and I think probably have a disrupted uh, lymphatics of the trunk and they go carnivore. I think of uh, my friend, Sean, who did this, he went carnivore and, but it was high fat carnivore. He gained 35 pounds and it was fluid. Because yeah. he overwhelmed his lymphatics at that time. They needed to heal first. And, and, and you did it absolutely right, Todd, by going higher protein first. That was dumb luck, but it worked. I was just listening to yeah, my body. Yeah, it definitely yeah. worked. Yeah. Fantastic. So. Um, let's see. What is, uh, what's that next slide? What do we got there? Um, so here's, here's some symptoms to look out for and see if this is you. Um, so if, if you get this sudden swelling in your trunk and abdominal ca cavity, people will tell me, and I think you guys have described this as well, that I wasn't pregnant, but now all of a sudden I'm nine months pregnant. I mean, it is, it's just huge, especially in the belly. Um, and then you can get actually some puffiness right here at, um, at the base of your neck on either side, this is a big uh, fluid depot. And I mean, I've seen people that just go straight up like that. So you get that swelling right there. And then um, uh, it, you can actually, the, it can go head, neck, um, trunk and genitals, especially for men. Um, it, there is, you know, a receptacle sure. waiting to be filled there. Um, so you can really get a, a lot of swelling right there and, and not so much in your arms or legs, but eventually it will also go there too. Typically with lymphedema, it starts in your limbs and then you will progress to your genitals and your trunk. But with what I'm talking about, it actually starts in the trunk and spreads out to the limbs. And so when we have it reversed like that, I start thinking about that there is something screwed up with the central lymphatics, the lymphatics of the trunk. You might have symptoms of uh, nutrient deficiency because remember your lymphatics are transporting that fat out of the intestines. And so you're not gonna get fat soluble vitamins. You're gonna be low in A, D, E, and K. 
Um, you probably be low in choline. Um, so you're looking at um, all those nutrient deficiencies. And then we already talked about the breathing difficulty because we're backing up into the lungs. Well, of course, you're getting abdominal pain and GI upset because you're backing into the intestines. Um, just weird trunk pains. Um, now, your head and neck uses gravity to come down. If you're full right here with fluid, that is getting pushed back up. People get tremendous brain fog and headaches. Um, they can't think straight because the fluid is backing up into their head and neck. Um, and then I really tell people to look for, do you get a lot of swelling in your belly after you eat, after you try to exercise? Um, some of you might be using a pneumatic pump. It's kind of a mechanical way of massaging your, your arms and your legs. And then it just kind of moves all that fluid and really bloats your belly. Um, some people were even wear compression garments and then it just pushes all the fluid and bloats your belly. Um, I've had patients to say, I have to lay down for a couple of days. Any prolonged sitting or standing, I get huge. So yeah. you, you, you live your life in bed because that's the only time you can get the fluid to go down. So these are symptoms that you may have an issue with the lymphatics in your trunk. You, you pegged about, you know, 85% of things <laughs> for me there for sure. Yeah. Um, another interesting thing I was going to ask you there when you're talking about um, kind of, kind of the intestinal problem since I've been on carnivore, Let's go I, ahead and take the slides off, Michael, and we'll talk. I crave vinegar all the time. Yes. And, and I started doing it, and it gives me so much more energy. It seems to make me break down and move fat better when I have vinegar. I don't yes. know why. It's one of the mm -hmm. non-carnivore foods I eat. Mm -hmm. Does does that make any sense to this? I feel like now... Well, I'm wondering about that because um, uh, Ben Bickman, in one of his blogs... This is Dr. Benjamin Bickman from um, uh, Brigham Young University in Utah. He said, vinegar is a short chain fatty acid. So it's like ketones are, you know. Yeah. So, so I'm wondering if, you know, you're, you're giving yourself uh, that fat that is actually helping um, and it's, and it's, um, uh, short chain um, and medium chain fatty acids don't go through the lymphatics. They bypass the lymphatics and go straight to the liver through the portal vein. That's why so it gives me more energy. You are doing then. something actually to help your whole body, but they're also giving your lymphatics of the trunk a break. That makes so sense. You're getting, that, that, yes, yes. That's huge because I do it because I get so much energy out of it. It, it I feel yes. like three times the amount of energy out of the dietary fat that I eat when I eat it with vinegar. Mm -hmm. You just pegged it because it doesn't have to go down the lymphatic system, yes. goes right to the liver and turns into ketones. And that's why I'm getting the energy out of it then. Yes. Yeah. So so, I'm no. And I'm just, I'm just putting that together right now with you, uh, you saying that Todd, that I'm going to have to add that to my list of, you know, a possible fix of, you know, what people can do. Cause we hear it all the time to use that. If you have any kind of digestive upset, maybe you're not, metabolizing your food good to, to have some, you know, apple cider vinegar. I mean, they talk about that all the time. And now I'm just thinking, oh, it bypasses lymphatics. It makes so much sense. You can ask these guys. They, I've been saying this for six months that I have to have vinegar with yeah. my fat. Yeah. Yeah. So, That's so funny. your, your high protein, your amino acids that you were doing and, and your um, vinegar. Wow. This is another breakthrough. This could be something that could really help people. I think so. I'm really loving this conversation because I think we're all kind of fig find, you know, finding some of this out in real time. And we kind of have a good test group of people here and especially in our audience because everybody's yeah. going through this. So yeah. well, that's incredible. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's not something that's very well understood at all. I'm going to show you um, in some of the other slides. Is I'm going to show you how we image it and, and it's it's very difficult to be done and so therefore not a lot of people are diagnosed because they're not getting imaged and so um and so the only people that are getting uh imaged they're taking them straight into to a surgical procedure and they're saving their life um but that's such a small group and so they really don't know um 
all of the potential people out there that are having issues with their central lymphatics that are contributing to a host of medical conditions. Um, and, and so th there's not a lot talked about this, but I'm, I think that there is, I, I do a lot of stuff with Kelly Bell, who he figured out what was going on. He's an engineer in the, um, and he was in the um, Coast Guard and he figured out because they injected plastic into his lymphatics, it was supposed to treat reflux, but instead of going to his esophagus, it went to his thoracic duct. Ooh. And so he um, is a meticulous self researcher um, and he's figured out a lot of this stuff. And because for years and years, they didn't know it was a lymphatic condition. He's figured out a lot of non-invasive self-management techniques that have worked for him. And now we're putting it out to the community and saying, we don't know, but you might try this. We might try the apple cider vinegar. <laughs> yeah. You might, you know, so, um, cause we're not sure um, what can be done. This is, this is something that, I mean, you're talking about something that I've just been talking to Kelly with for like the last four or five years. And then we're, we're starting to, well, I do this and it seems to help, but I do this and it seems to help. Um, but everybody is so different. So uh, I'm going to give you a variety of strategies that you could try. Um, a lot of them, hopefully in conjunction with, with a um, really good, uh, like a functional medicine um, or a naturopath type of a practitioner that can um, monitor you and, and, and help you through the, the experimentation. Because we really don't know. We're trying stuff out because people are suffering. They need help. So bad. And I, I think you were so right when you said this goes so underdiagnosed that people think it's a weight problem. They treat it as yes. a weight problem. Yes. Yes. And then, you, you know, I mean, you pegged me because I, I've lost, you know, 300 pounds twice in my life before by always a starvation diet, like not eating for 17 yeah. months. Yes. And as soon as you eat, it comes back on. The food sure. comes back on and you sure. just get hammered. Yes. And it's just like, you know, the, it's never a calorie restricted. It's never the answer. It never has been. And yes. so it, I think. Starvation I think is not sustainable. No. <laughs> it is not sustainable. And, you know, and, and we're asking people to really harm themselves because mm -hmm. eventually you have to eat. And so that weight goes up and down. And this is, this is harming them. And we're telling them that's the only way. That right. is, it's, it's unconscionable. For sure. Well, this is a, this is incredible. Uh, do you want to keep going through the slides before sure, we answer let's questions? Sure. Next one, Michael. Yeah. So we looked at those symptoms. Okay, and I just wanted to show uh, this is a uh, a woman who had a bona fide central lymphatic issue. They said you're just obese. Okay, um, uh, but just in within a couple of days, and she got even much worse than this. But do you see how that kind of that chipmunk look there? Okay. Um, because this, this fluid wants to come down here, but she was so full here, it couldn't get out. And so it's building up in there. And so you will see that facial swelling and you will see, um, uh, I think that a lot of people, they're, they're taking, um, as you did, Lindy, and you're taking those pictures of your face and they're seeing, um, you know, the face slimmer, face bigger, face slimmer. And then they're thinking, oh, OK, I must have weighed more right here. And now I weighed less there. I mean, definitely, as you lose weight, your face slims down, too. But if you get that up and down look, it's not all about whether or not you weigh more. It, it, that's fluid that's backing up into there when it when it doesn't when it fluctuates like that. Um, that's about fluid backing up into there. Let's go to the next one, Michael. So this is um, Kelly and I, we're, we're thinking about, okay, what is the process? How does this happen? And we think that there's two different pathways. The, the first pathway is that we have this um, reflux. They have stuff going the wrong way, fluid going the wrong way. And that can lead to inflammation and fibrosis. So almost like a hardening of the organs. So now the organs can't function as well. You think of fatty liver disease, right? And there's lots of fibrosis with that and the hardening. The liver does not work right anymore. And so that gives you organ failure. Another pathway is that now the, um, the entire lymphatic system can't transport fluid like it should. So you get, get back up into the limbs and then the head and neck. And now so you have that increased swelling, 
throughout and now increase inflammation and increase fibrosis throughout. I think you guys that were talking before we, we went on about that hardness, how the, yeah. the area gets just, I mean, rock hard. Like um, yeah. Yes. And so now the lymphatic system is really taxed. It starts failing. It leaves more and more fluid. And so do you see at the end, the two red um, areas there, it's a feedback. They go back and forth that is causing more lymphatic failure and more organ failure. And, and then you die. I mean, it, things are not functioning right and you die. So this is something that um, there is still, it's a spectrum. We have people that are just kind of sluggish through their trunk and they can live for a long time. They feel awful, <laughs> but they can live for a long time like that. Um, and, and then others that it's, it's an emergency surgery that we have to get open that pathway and get that fluid out or they're going to die. So I would say that most people are more on that chronic sluggishness that just makes life miserable on um, that end of the spectrum. So it's not so urgent, but I mean, it's, it's probably taking, you know, years off your life. So we need to do something to help people to um, manage this. For sure. Absolutely. So, and this is, I just put some benign pictures in here to kind of show people how that fluid can really protrude the belly and then eventually um, uh, lead to that apron um, uh, developing. Um, Michael, do you want to show a picture of, of what that could look like yep. if you have a, an apron? So this is not... When we think about that apron or that the belly protruding so much that it hangs down, that's not just from fat collecting. I, I refuse to believe that. I, I think that there is a lot of fluid in there and that that weight of the fluid makes it stretch more and more down. And so that you stretch the skin out, the weight of that stretches the skin out and you have that um that really going down low. And, and so now you are looking, I can see your toes down there. And so we're really looking from the top down. We have yes. all the lobules. Um, it could be the belly, it could be the medial thighs. That's the weight of that fluid at the bottom of those areas that is just stretching out the skin and making it larger and larger. This is not just fat proliferation. This is fluid that is doing that. And I, I would get blisters all along the side and it would just nonstop leaking. And then the skin just continually break down and it just, the, the sores would get worse and worse. Yes. Yeah. So that fluid is trying to find its way out and it will come out through your skin. Yes. If you have just had any kind of fat in your, in your meal at all, it will look white. The lymphatic fluid looks white. And so you will see this milky white fluid that is leaking. But the rest of the time, if it's away from a meal, it'll be just clear fluid that's leaking out. Sometimes it will have a little bit of a yellowish tinge. So that's what I'm uh, talking about um, is that dysfunction in our trunk um, that either oh. from a... a in a surgery or could have been damaged because simply because you develop the obesity for whatever reason that that damages the trunk uh, lymphatics and then it, it just snowballs it gets out of control before we come back to that that just brought i because now i just had a question i'm going to show this screen but here in this middle top picture that's like uh this is the last time i took pictures but yes um but anyhow i was down to i, I you know, in this green picture, I was 720 pounds down here. And then here in the middle, I was down to 647 pounds, so on and so forth. But this picture here, most people would say that I look probably three or 400 pounds in this picture. Mm -hmm. But I was actually uh, dressed. I was still 500 pounds. I always weigh like a hundred and some pounds yes. heavier than anybody would guess. Yes. And I, I think that's because it's fluid and not fat. Yes. I think yes. it's so much fluid. Yes, there's a lot of fluid in there. Yep. Yeah, that's yep. what I've been wondering lately because we're getting a DEXA scan when we go to Hack Your Health here in a month because I'm like, what am I made out of? Why do I weigh like lead all the time? Lead, you know? that's right. Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, doing that body composition, um, anybody out there who's considering going keto or carnivore, do a body composition first and you want to know fluid, fat, uh, lean mass, um, Bone, bone density would be wonderful too. Um, but 
you want to track how those change over the course of using the diet. Um, you should lose a lot of fluid. And people always say that, well, you know, that's just water weight. Hey, I don't care what kind of weight it is. We got to get that fluid out of there. Michael goes to the hospital twice a year with an infection because of that fluid. We want to get rid of that water weight. Absolutely. Yeah. And that, that's why the next person I hear say, oh, you didn't lose fat. You just lost water weight. I'm going to punch him in. <laughs> it's not a just. This is yeah. as important as losing the fat. Yes. Exactly. It's so crazy for sure. Should we go back to the. Yeah. Let's what's up next. Okay. So this is, um, and I want people to think about what are the conditions are you diagnosed with? Because do you see how this, these are involved. A lot of these involve the organs of your trunk. So do you have a uh, congestive heart failure? Well, it's probably cause fluids going the wrong way into your heart. Do you have kidney failure? Do you have respiratory or pulmonary disease, irritable bowel disease, fluid going the wrong way into your intestines, um, uh, chronic liver disease. Um, chyloptysis is very interesting because when we got fluid going, uh, we got, when we got chyle or lymph fluid that has fat in it, when we got chyle going the wrong way into our lungs, you um, cough up sputum that is absolutely white. It should be yellow. And that white sputum is probably chyle that went the wrong way. Um, into your lungs. So um, that is often diagnostic of a central lymphatic issue. Um, fluid going wrong way into the uterus and getting endometriosis. Um, just general aches and pains and you might get diagnosed with fibromyalgia. We're thinking it's also why um, some people get that prolonged long COVID. Um, and this is just the tip of the iceberg of a lot of those conditions that you could be getting, they're saying, oh, it's because you're obese. No, it's because your lymphatics are screwed up. <laughs> For sure. hmm. And so um, what we were, we're also trying to collect information from anecdotally, what are the lab tests? What are the blood tests that might show that there's um, a uh, an issue with your the lymphatics of your trunk. Well, in the literature, the, the um, researchers that talk about this condition, they talk about the triglycerides going really high. They're usually over 240, um, but it's not that isolated blood number. It's, it's in, in combination with other stuff. And so when you look at um, all those tests that, that test your liver function and your kidney function, um, when that starts going wrong, that could indicate a, uh, a lymphatic disorder. Um, it's, we just had a woman um, who had a, we know she had a central lymphatic issue and her estrogen was through the roof. Why? I'm not entirely certain, but she had super elevated estrogen and super low iron. Um, we're also finding that um, the lymphatics are needed to send, uh, to transport a lot of these minerals. And if they're not transporting them, it's very odd. Uh, copper is a big one that people end up being low in copper. Now, Kyle Urea, I think the next slide, let's talk about that one. Because remember, Kyle is that milky substance that, um, your, that comes out of your intestines. It's the fat that you're being transported by the lymphatics. It should go to your blood right up below your collarbone, but it's not in this condition. In this, and if it's backing up your kidneys, you will have Kyle in your urine. You should never have any chyle in your urine. So if you are getting that back up into the kidney and you have chyle in your urine, that's pretty much diagnostic that you have an issue. But the thing is that just because you don't have chyle in your urine doesn't mean you don't have an issue because it, the issue might be higher up. It might instead be going to your lungs and, and back up in there and not backing up into your kidney. So, but this is one way if you do this test, it's just a urine test. Um, if you do this test and there's Kyle in your urine, that is diagnostic. Um, and so would that look like cloudy and, and real foamy bubbly pee? So yeah, so you look at these pictures and it's talking about, you know, and, and uh, zero hours after eating, two hours, four hours. And so we're getting more and more fat building up into the kidneys and going into the, the urine. Um, mm -hmm. So um, you're... You know, that's right. what it would look like. Yes, cloudy. 
Yeah. But then getting um, worse and worse after you've had a lot of fat in your meal, um, yeah. it'll have a different odor, not the yeah. odor that you would expect. And, and yes, that foamy bubbly that you're talking about. Yeah. Yes. I just wonder, cause I, I've been noticing, and I was wondering what was going on, but I noticed uh, uh, that when I, when I fast, especially if I dry fast, yes. I'll cloudy and, and foamy pee. <laughs> And so something's going on there. Yeah, I, I would have I would expect it to get more cloudy with eating. So right. that's interesting. So I mean, there's you can see there's more we have to learn, you know, yeah. a lot of the things you would expect don't happen. And <laughs> so you're yeah. trying to figure out why, why not? Let's go to the next one, Michael. So we want to get we got want to get imaged, and there is a, a certain imaging process called magnet magnetic resonance lymphography. So it's an MRL and it is, um, they inject it into your lymphatics, um, right at your groin. And it's very difficult to do because they want to get into the lymphatics and not a vein or an artery. You know, you want to go to the lymphatics. It is hard to do. They're usually getting it through. They have lymph nodes that are at your groin. And then you've got to image it in this MRL machine and it's small and you only, you can't weigh more than 250 pounds. And so I'm thinking that there's this whole segment of people that might have this issue that they cannot be imaged. Not only that, you pen that I have pictured there in uh, Philadelphia, that's the only place that does that in the United States. So you can't go anywhere else and they don't have a machine that can accommodate you. So what do you do? Well, the next slide, um, this is what's coming up on the horizon is that they're making a drinkable contrast and then you get a PET scan. And so if you can go to a local place, if they have a PET scan machine that can accommodate your size, all you do is have to drink something. It's not a surgical procedure to get the dye into your lymphatics. You drink this and then they can watch where that contrast is. It's kind of a high fat contrast where it goes. Um, and they can see, oh, you, you're getting a leak here, you're getting a leak there, it's refluxing into this organ. They can see all that. Um, it's, we're hoping, um, uh, actually Dr. Itkin at UPenn is, is gonna be doing um, a study on this. They're developing the contrast and um, it's sometime this year, they're supposed to be doing that study and then um, it will be available to people. So, um, if you can't get to Philadelphia or if you can't fit into the machine, this might be a way that you can um, get imaged. But still, there's going to be a lot of people that still can't do that. And so we're, we're, uh, when I'm working with Kelly, we're just saying, let's just go by symptoms and let's try some things that are non-invasive, like eating a high protein carnivore diet <laughs> and, and, see if that works and people are going to have to self um, experiment hopefully with some kind of health uh, care provider monitoring them i'd love to see this i'm going to be excited when that when we start getting more information on that die test yes yes so this is you know what we've come up with so far um so lots of nutritional strategies main thing is to restrict carbohydrate intake however you are on that spectrum of restricting carbohydrates. Um, there has been studies on mice that shows that the lymphatics get so inflamed, get so swollen that they transport 50% less fluid in the response to eating a high carbohydrate diet. So the single best thing you can do is, is decrease the carbohydrate. And, and this low fat dieting is killing our lymphatics because the lymphatics have the larger ones actually have ability to pump. They have this internal contraction ability and they, they contract faster in response to dietary fat. So um, it is my belief that that's, it's, it's healing to the lymphatics as long as they're not um, so impaired there. We don't want them to be overwhelmed with lots of fat, but they need some, they need those essential fatty acids. So, However you're going to restrict those carbs and get enough fat, you're going to do exogenous ketones that don't use lymphatics but give you energy might be a way. Apple cider vinegar. 
<laughs> might be a way. Um, and there's a couple supplements I'll show you in the next slide. Breathing, it, it is, we've seen with imaging that the action of inhalation and exhalation causes our lymphatics to pump faster. So we're, you know, we recommend a lot of deep breathing exercises to get those lymphatics. Do you ever try um, Wim Hof breathing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Then there are people that do that. Absolutely. Um, and, and again, because that Wim Hof breathing, it can, you know, do various things, get you to be overheated when it's really cold. And, and uh, you know, so I, I always tell people, don't do that stuff by yourself. Make sure there's someone with you and, and have some guidance. But I think there's a, a breathing can be a very, very powerful um, way to help you manage this kind of condition. So absolutely, Michael, you know, experience. That's how I, that's how I started this thing was doing because I was on oxygen. So yes. I started doing Wim Hof breathing early yes. on, like within my first two weeks of carnivore. Yes. And lo and behold, my legs used to be third. My calves were over 36 in diameter, each one of them. Yes. And I'd have to tie a rope around my ankles to lift it up on a footstool because I couldn't uh -huh. lift my legs. Yes. And yes. it was miserable. And then that would make my knees just kill me to have my feet on a footstool. Yes. It was a whole problem. Mm -hmm. I started doing the Wim Hof breathing and I didn't realize till later it was moving the diaphragm that was loosening up that plug, you know, that jam in my waist and stuff. Mm -hmm. And it was helping the lymphatic system move. And I didn't realize yes. that. But yes. but every like I was gonna ask you that because my this is just my pure intuition of of working on things that the things that I felt, cause I was going to ask you, this is, these are the things that I felt did the best for me. And I wanted to know if they made sense or if it's just in my head. Yeah. So I finally got a bed that has raises the feet and I love yes. to sleep yes. with my feet above my head. That was number one that I think does a lot. Number two was the breathing. Mm -hmm. Number three was uh, number three. Most effective is long fasting, like over 70 hours. Yes. Yes, because I mean, the it's unfortunate that something that you need food <laughs> can actually exacerbate what's going on. And um, you know, we thought, we, well, let's just restrict the carbs, get, you know, fill in with fat, that should be okay. But um, some people, they, when they get advanced uh, issues, no matter what they eat, it causes their belly to bloat, and it causes extra fluid, fluid load. And so um, the only thing that works is fasting. But I mean, sooner or later you have to eat. So we hope that it's more keto carnivore um, when you do eat. Yes, you're absolutely yeah. right. So you Todd, yeah, so you've out a lot of the stuff on your own. So the fasting and then Lindy and Michael introduced me to my shake plate, which I now love. And I stand on that shake plate and I do uh, yes. squats and then I do calf yeah. raises. And those seem to help a ton. Uh, and I do those. So when you see down there below on that last bullet, one of those things is vibration. Yeah. And yes, this we're absolutely finding this um, uh, um, anecdotally. Um, and it could be maybe you can't stand on a vibration plate. Maybe you sit on it. Maybe yeah. you just put your leg on it. Uh, maybe you have, I have a, a, a patient who has a just a, uh, it looks like a heating pad that vibrates and he puts that across his belly. Mm. And he's losing measurement. I mean, he's measurable going inches down, but just by putting this vibration on his belly. Well, so I, when I, when I first video. started it, one of the most effective ways to use the vibration plate was actually to lay on the floor and put my calves on it because that's yes. where I had it all. And yes. then that raised my calves above my heart. And it mm -hmm. also shook the back of my calves. And that yes. seemed to help the most. And I will tell everybody who's listening to that, um, if you can't get your legs above your heart or above your head, don't worry. Just getting that, getting them horizontal is a great start and you will have uh, improvement with that. And then as you're able to get them up a little bit more, fantastic. But don't worry that if you can't at first get it above your heart. Okay, that that, that was fantastic to know that that was work, you know, because when, when you're, Stab and blind, you're not sure if this is in your head or if it's really doing what yes, I think it's yes. doing. You were doing something. And so you look at a lot of these um, things that, you know, the acoustic wave, cavitation, uh, deep oscillation, and uh, oscillation. It is all like variety on the same theme. We're shaking things up. And it's, it does it do it because of different pressures? Does it do it because we're breaking down fibrosis and it's letting things flow? 
we're not entirely sure, just that it works. Yeah, and one thing I couldn't do was everybody kept telling me to do the compression socks. They made it worse because they were too tight. Yes. Yeah. So, and very uncomfortable. Did you experience that, Lindy, that it was uncomfortable? Oh, yes. for sure. I couldn't get them on. It was too oh. difficult. Yeah. yeah. And, and then they just, they squeeze the, actually, yeah. the knees. And then your foot would swallow up. Yeah. 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 It was painful. Yeah. So I, I would actually recommend a lot of these strategies first. And then, especially when you get a lot of that stretched out redundant skin because you've lost so much fluid, then you're going to want to have some kind of support on that those areas to keep the fluid from wanting to fill that up again. I, I like using Velcro applications because you can adjust it to what you can tolerate. So, Linda, you're telling saying that it was hard to get on, but also painful. It should never be painful. And I like the Velcro options because you can adjust it by what you need that day. Yeah. So these are a lot of things we're looking to. And I'm going to add to that slide, apple cider vinegar. <laughs> I'm helping me for, and I just, again, that was one of those things. I'm like, is this in my head? Why do I feel so good? You know, and somebody's like, oh, you're just having carb cravings. I'm like, I've never craved vinegar a day in my life until I got a carnivore and now my body loves it, but mm -hmm. that's awesome. Do we have some more slides here? Yeah. So I want to talk about these and these you absolutely have to have your medical provider um, do for you, even though the first ones are just over the counter supplements, they could react, you know, with uh, what other conditions you have, they might react badly with that you might interact badly with some medications you're taking. So even though I'm putting these up here, you can't just go out and buy them and start taking them. Talk to your healthcare provider, uh, talk to one that you trust and discuss this. But um, another one of Kelly's theories is that um, we're getting thickening um, coagulation of the lymph, just like your blood can thicken or coagulate, the lymph can too. And the thicker um, lymph is going to flow slower and be harder to get out. Um, and so um, there are some over-the-counter supplements that, that have that action of not only thinning your blood, but also your lymph. And that's melatonin, red clover, rutin, and bromelain. Do not do this on your own, okay? Um, and then um, prescription um, uh, would be heparin, which is an anticoagulant. Um, some of my patients, the best they felt ever with their whole trunk and everything was when they were in the hospital, that maybe they had some kind of surgical procedure, and then they had to start to prevent blood clots from forming. They were on heparin. And I thought, wow, I felt fabulous and, and lost a lot of fluid and stuff like that. So we're thinking it, it might be because um, the, the lymph fluid is, is thickening. Um, and then separate from that whole idea of lymph coagulation is possibly exogenous ketones um, might be a way to give your body the fuel without overtaxing uh, impaired um, trunk lymphatics. And so just another way to get you yourself healthy fat is through ketones. That's awesome. Okay. And then uh, this is just, you know, if you're going to try this stuff, um, you know, be careful, have someone monitoring you. Um, like if you get a vibration plate like Todd has, um, start with just a couple of minutes because you have no idea how you're going to respond. So you're going to be just starting gentle, lower intensity, shorter time. And then as, if you're feeling good, still okay, you can start going longer. Um, and, and I just, I, I really like to have someone checking you for and asking you because if you're getting brain fog from trying something, you're not able to track your symptoms and what's happening with you. So someone else can be talking to you. Did you feel a little nauseous after we tried that? Did you get lightheaded? Um, or are you peeing more? Good. <laughs> but did you get a headache or do you feel clear headed? I mean, so we want someone to be monitoring how you respond to the various things and making sure that you're safe. What do you think about rebounding? I've actually Right off there, Michael. Rebounding. Excellent question, Lindsay. Go ahead. Yeah, my vibration plate has actually broken, and I saw some YouTube videos about rebounding and how it's really good for the lymph um, circulation. 
So I bought one and I jump on it sort of five, ten minutes every morning. And then every time I get up, I go and do another quick bounce throughout the day. And I'm finding I'm, yeah, it's really helping with the the edema because I do a lot of sitting. I work at home and on the computer all day. So this is a chance to get going. So, yeah, what are your thoughts on rebounding? Yeah, I it, I think it potentially is very uh, effective. I actually got a rebounder myself. Oh. I've been trying it, and you know where I feel it. And I, Lindy, tell me if this is where you feel it too. Mostly in my calves. Um, and, and I'm yes. not even leaping up off of it. I my feet stay in contact with the rebounder the whole time, and I have that uh, bar, so I'm holding on <laughs> to make sure that I don't fall over. Um, and so. Your calf muscle is huge for pumping fluid against gravity. It's helping with your venous return and also the lymphatic return. So that may be the biggest thing. There is also this other theory about why rebounding may work. Um, That impact, what they think is that the the valves open in response to the impact. And if the valves are opening and uh, we're able to, and now the muscle is pumping, we're getting that fluid. It's just more effective at moving that fluid against gravity. So there could be multiple actions. I do think that as long as you're safe with it and stick like you do, Lindy, short times and and see how you do, I think it could be very powerful. Yeah. Well, obviously at 800 pounds, rebounding was not for me. Yes. further on in my journey I just wanted to up my game a little bit and yes. rebound works for me now yes. so yes. I still still use both I've still got the uh, vibration plate but it's I can't stand on it or do anything because it's broken but yes. um yeah it's, it has kind of optimized my carnival journey and yes. really helps the, yes. the little, yeah. I think that is super important what you said that when we first start this journey it has to be all about diet yes um do not even think that you have to start exercising at that point. Once your pain goes down, once your size goes down so that you, you're physically able to be more mobile, then you're going to start adding some movements. Don't even worry about, uh, I, I do not recommend my patients go straight to the exercise component. I think it's, it, we really we need to do some healing first and that's going to be through diet or fasting. It's, you know, I couldn't have done, I couldn't get off. I was stuck in a recliner for two and a half years. I couldn't yes. move. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. It, but I mean, I could sit six months. I lost 205 pounds and was off oxygen. So yes. yeah, it's just, yeah. Carnivore or where we were stuck is just, it gives you options again to start doing some healthier movements and things, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. you can't. You can't exercise your way out of that 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 bad diet, you know. Yes, it's, it's, yes, yes. It's impossible. Don't let anybody guilt you into that, saying that you have to do that. Um, this no. is and, and something that hurts. Stop. <laughs> so it, this is we do not have to have pain to get better. So, yeah. All right. Well, I think we're in a good spot now to start on questions because I think we got a bunch of them. You are a hit. We have like over 50 questions now, I think. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> so, no worries. Um, so I was going to start with the first one because I didn't write it down, but I, I took it off my phone. So that mm-hmm. I, I'm just going to read it. Uh, we have a subscriber that wants to know if you can exercise, if exercise will eliminate or even, or at least improve uh, lower lymphatic swelling. So, um, yes, when you feel capable of doing it, and, and um, even if, say, you're, um, you're in your recliner and um, you can safely, without pain, just point and flex your ankle and use that calf muscle to help. Now, it, you, if you've elevated, so even if you only get to this far and you're not even only up to here, but you've got, you, you're, you're not in that totally dependent position, you're up. And now you're doing point and flex, you're activating your calf muscle, or maybe you can't even do that. Just do isometric. You know, someone pushes on the top of your foot and you try to push against them gently. Um, So even those little muscle contractions are going to help your lymphatics move up your leg. Or even just rolling your feet. That's what I do. I I do the the pedaling and while I'm sitting here and I roll my feet around. Yes. And, And you'd be surprised how much that helps. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And 
we were also talking about breathing. So do some deep breathing as you guys already do. I posted the link for Wim, Wim Hof, the beginner's guide in here. So. Yeah. Yes. Very good. Very nice. Hey, do you have that? Yeah, there you go. I do. You are the man. <laughs> do you want to read it? I have the glasses on. <laughs> yes. Uh, have you heard about, uh, oh, sorry. My camera's in the way. Uh, shoot hold on sorry let me put this on the other screen so that i can see it oh no um uh, and I, I i can read it so have you heard about the research done by dr joel wallach and dr gerard Schrauza on selenium and how it strengthens the immune system i believe these are some of the issues that respond well to selenomethionine supplements as well as fibromyalgia cystic fibrosis do you know um, and, and this is so interesting. I had not considered that and thank you for bringing it to my attention, but um, women with lipedema are known to be a, a lot of them, a, a big subset of them are low in selenium. And they are told to eat um, a couple of Brazil nuts every day to try to increase their selenium. So um, yes, I do believe and, and our lymphatic system is our immune system. So you may have something there. And I thank you for bringing it to my attention. And I used to have seriously swollen legs. And when I quit eating sugar and tortilla chips, the swelling went away. Yes, I've, I've just found that anecdotally on so many people. There were occasional um, foods that would make it happen again once in a while. But since I went on keto, they stopped swelling up. Yes. Since the swelling has gone away, though, my shins are very red and look terrible. The skin almost feels like leather. Do you know anyone healing this with the carnivore or anything else? So you may have um, your your veins were impacted as well as your lymph, uh, your lymphatics. And so and now it's just more um, visible. You get a lot of that swelling out. And now we can really see what's happening with your veins. And so uh, your veins will likely need some support. But yes, there is research in animals that shows that those carbs actually make your veins and your lymphatics leaky. And so by eliminating those carbs, as you say, you got better when you, you cut out sugar and you went keto. So you can heal. I don't know if what you, you have is going to be completely reversible. It may be that you always need some support for those veins. Um, so you might always need some kind of uh, compression stocking or something like that, but you can get better, stay off the, the sugar and the carbs and um, that will improve. But I, what you're describing sounds like it's, it's veins. I had the redness in the front of my shins as well, almost mm -hmm. purple in color, and that is slowly going away. There's yeah. still a discoloration but not as bad as it was so mm -hmm. i'm confident if i continue doing what i'm doing that uh, it will get a lot better over time yes. yes yes absolutely that that's wonderful news um let's see my 14 year old daughter had cancer when she was one and has been off therapy for years they just did a repeat mri to check for relapse um I'm not sure what that says there. She had an area that kept painfully swelling up and feels like a lump. Scan was clear. The initial ultrasound looking for a hernia. Um, and I'm wondering where the area is. Can you tell where that was? Because what happens a lot of times when you've had a really bad illness, um, your lymphatics have been stressed because they're the immune system. You can, your lymph nodes can enlarge and sometimes they don't go down and you can have permanently enlarged lymph nodes. So that might be what that is. Um, let's see, and so uh, in November showed only a lymph node. I'm thinking that was, it's, it's functional, but it's larger than usual. And usually we can't see or palpate our nodes, but after an illness or a huge stress, it might be it always um, enlarged. I um, got a college agreed when I asked about possibility of a blocked lymph tissue, but she only sent referral to urology. How interesting. So can I tell you that physicians only, um, they get about 20 minutes about the lymphatic system, about as much as they get about nutrition, right? So wow. yeah, they don't know it unless they go into oncology. They really don't know anything about the lymphatic system. It's not their fault. It's a failing of medical schools. And so 
this person got sent to urology. Um, I was just watching a playback and heard Dr. Chafee mention lymph system is somehow related to fat. Yes, because it transports all that yummy fat. Um, I love Dr. Chafee. He's good. Yeah. Um, we are a carnivore family of six months. Oh, yay for the whole family. I, I'm wondering about you guys. I mean, does your whole family eat that way or is it just you? My husband does and my one of my daughters is low carb. The other one's not. <laughs> so working on it. Yeah. Yeah. My my uh my brother went carnivore and my sister went carnivore with me. Mom's still being stubborn, but yeah, yeah. How about you, Mike? It's just me. So oh, yeah, I'm just carnivore. You're you're the black sheep. <laughs> um, let's see, it's helped her to gain about 10 pounds of much needed weight. Is it possible our body is trying to flush out the old chemo toxins? Absolutely. Is it related to fat or did I misunderstand? If there is a clog in the lymphatic system, how do we help it out? And so um, I think you guys have probably talked about this, um, how eating keto and carnivore is not a weight loss diet. It's a weight regulation diet, right? And so some people, and this person, she just gained 10 pounds because she needed it, right? Yeah. And so it's not like, I've had people, patients tell me, well, I can't keep eating this way because I'm just going to waste away. <laughs> right. I mean, that's what they're worried about because there's, there's so much hype in the media that this is a, you know, the best weight loss diet ever. And you guys are losing hundreds of pounds. Yeah. So people are worried about that. It's that won't happen. You get to the, what is your body wants for health. It's weight regulating. And absolutely, chemotoxins can stay in your body for a long time. They're stuck in your liver. Um, they, they could be stuck in your, um, your uh, nervous system. And so this is a way to help get those toxins out. She might also be benefit from lymphatic massage to help get the, the toxins out. Um, and that also can help with if there is a clog in the, the lymphatic system. So I would recommend, and I'll, I'll uh, maybe I, if I can post in the chat, I'll, I'll recommend how to find a lymphatic therapist, a certified lymphatic therapist in your area and, and go there and get a lymphatic massage. I mean, it's, it's good just for general health, but if you've got any kind of condition, this can help with getting the toxins out and helping your lymphatic system function. Thank you. I've been wondering about the lymphatic massages. Is a geez. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and it's true. I, I like using um, the uh, Lymphatic Education Research Network, or it's called LEARN. Um, they do a lot of stuff with education and research in lymphatics, but they have a kind of a one-stop shop of finding, you know, put where you live and then who are the certified therapists in your area um, so that you can get help. Sometimes they're covered by insurance, sometimes not. Um, uh, but I would highly recommend uh, if you're having what you feel like is a clog or a, a buildup of toxins, you know, going to a certified therapist would be beneficial. There are some who work in home health. You're homebound. Have someone come to your house. Awesome. Hey, uh, does liposuction damage the lymphatic system? So um, traditional liposuction um, very much can, um, but now um, this is something that we do a lot for uh, women with lipedema and they have all that excessive lower body fat before we figured out uh, five or so years ago before the global community found out that, that keto and carnivore would work. Um, a lot of women just went straight to liposuction and um, they have uh, a technique that was developed in Germany called lymph sparing liposuction. You need to go to a plastic surgeon who has experience in working with um, lymphatic disorders like lipedema. Um, and I would even go get a um, consult with two or three before picking your, your surgeon. Um, I would direct people to um, the website lipedema project.org. That's L-I-P-E-D-E-M-A project.org. We have a, pro a provider directory. On the, there's a map of the world. And then on the bottom that has, you can look at uh, 
therapist, uh, surgeon, doctor, you want to click on surgeon and then um, see if there is a surgeon near you. Most, uh, because there's not that many that I've experienced with lipedema um, uh, or just getting a liposuction when you have a lymphatic condition, you, you might need to travel. So consider that. And I would highly, highly recommend that you want to do a healthy carbohydrate restricted diet prior to surgery. Um, and then after surgery as well, too, because it'll decrease your chance of getting um, an infection. They'll heal better. There'll be less post-surgical swelling. So it shouldn't just be that surgery in isolation. You, you need to have, it needs to be a holistic approach. And diet is a big part of that. I love uh, Dr. Uh, Nadeev Shapira. He's in, I think, Rhode Island. He promotes a ketogenic diet. So, um, you know, going to someone like that as experienced with lymphatic disorders and promotes diet, good choice. Wonderful. <laughs> Get the next question, Michael. Yep. Yeah, um, update. My, yeah. Oh, my question okay. This is very good. Yeah. What's the difference between lymphedema and lipedema? Is there a difference? Uh, a symmetrical swelling and that I did not talk about that in the beginning. That is an excellent point. Whoever um, brought that up because lipedema, um, that's that disorder that starts with excessive fat is symmetrical. Now, once you get an ex of extra fluid load, um, then it can become asymmetrical. One leg can be bigger than the other, but when you're just, when you're just starting, it's just lipedema without a lot of swelling, it's symmetrical. Lymphedema, when it happens in both legs, they are never the same size, unless the lymphedema is because of organ failure. You're having uh, liver failure or kidney failure or uh, lung or heart failure, um, and then it will be a very symmetrical swelling. But um, a lot of times it, it's, it, um, that's a kind of a shiny leg. Um, if it's due to um, just because of obesity and being overweight, symmetrical, and the skin can get very shiny. Um, but lymphedema, say, to because um, of an imperfect lymphatic system or because you were um, uh, uh, you had cancer treatment, you might have it in both legs because like you had ovarian cancer or prost prostate cancer or something, you got it in both legs. One is always bigger than the other. So when you have that asymmetry, I would lean towards lymphedema and then, but if it started out very symmetrical and then became asymmetrical, then I might think of a combination and you're a woman, I might uh, go to a combination of lymphedema and lipedema. Interesting. I find my left side is larger than my right, my leg and my arm. Oh, and, oh, and their arm too. How interesting. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, point. consulting with that certified uh, lymph lymphatic therapist or lymphedema therapist can help you tease out because they do a full history and they're looking at, well, did you break that arm? Did you, you know, I mean, you, you get to, um, you put, when you put that whole history, then you say, oh, okay, I think this is what's going on. Um, lymphedema therapists, we're like um, detectives. And I, for me, I, I love doing the initial evaluation and, and, and working with the patient to kind of solve the mystery, right? And, and put together what we think is happening with, because we're experts in lymphatics and you are expert in your own body. So we, with that partnership, we can a lot of times figure out what's happening. Yeah, it's just a matter of finding someone who it's happy for you being on a carnival diet because you're always, yeah, it's a bit taboo. Yeah, I, I know that's 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 too bad. But I tell you that um, I, I I was talking to a lymphedema therapist in a colleague in San Diego, California, and she was very much plant based, you know, low calorie with all of her patients, and she had lipedema herself, and this is what she did to to manage it. And uh, you know, over the years we talk. And um, I just saw her give a presentation at a, a lymphedema conference. And she said, so for lymphedema, we're really thinking that it worked best to have an anti-inflammatory, ketogenic, or carnivore diet. This is someone who had been a vegetarian. Wow. <laughs> so so they, they do come around. 
you just you, you don't push it you just keep talking about it and then they kind of they come around they they eventually um see that this is it's better for our bodies yeah oh that's good to know yeah. <laughs> nice. everybody watching this happen that has told this we're going to have a heart attack a stroke or get <laughs> colon cancer because i cannot wait uh -huh. to get down to 200 pounds, get the skin cut off and five years from now still be here. Cause you know, it's, it's going to well, be. We, we all should have been dead 10 years ago, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, I was so wondering I was about wondering what water, water intake. Yeah. And if doing some dry fasting would help. So interestingly, your water intake, um, a lot of people think, well, I've got a swelling disorder. Maybe I should have less water. And actually, when you have, if you drink less, if you dehydrate yourself, your body gets worried and it starts holding on to that water. So you'll have even more water retention. It's just like if you become low salt, you swell because your body's trying to find a way to conserve the salt, right? So, um, so um, I think it is much harder on you to be um, dehydrated or low water and, um, and low, uh, low sodium. Um, and some of the very, very good um, textbooks on lymphatic disorders say that it is absolutely wrong for our patients to decrease their water and their salt intake. Because most of us are told, you know, don't have salt, it makes you swell, right? Well, only if you eat carbs. <laughs> so, and, and dry fasting, um, I get really worried about electrolytes and hydration with dry fasting. Um, what, what's your guys' opinion on that one? So they've gotten kind of addicted to it because mm -hmm. I do a lot of fasting. I, I, I eat 84 hours, so I eat in an 84 hour window and then and a, a week and then I fast for 84 hours a week. But, and you don't drink anything. Well, no, I do, but well, I, I dry fast for 24 hours and then okay. I drink for 24 hours okay. and then I dry fast for 24 okay. hours. Okay. And uh, yeah. I, and I, I, I would just recommend sure. people, you know, they, they get the, um, the help, the guidance um, with someone like Jason Fong or someone who is, you know, cognizant of, of fasting and making sure that you're safe. Well, I got to shout out the SBG's uh, Steak and Butter Gang. Uh, we're all members of the Steak and Butter Gang. Mm -hmm. And they have a protocol there about priming. And primed fasting is way better than any. I, I used to white knuckle fast and it was pretty terrible. Now fast are easy. It basically, it's uh, nourishing the body before you try to fast. So heal the body, get all of your electrolytes, get in a really good position. I primed for six months and gained 20 pounds of muscle and healthy body tissue before I ever mm -hmm. started doing that. Now it's very easy. So I'm very comfortable doing those, but mm -hmm. it's why we only, it's why I only do a 24 hour dry fast because then it does start to wear you out of electrolytes for sure. Yeah. 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 Very good. Uh, my father suffered from lymphedema. I'm worried that I also suffer from this as I age. I was starting to get some leg swelling before turning to a low carb lifestyle. My question is, does a whole body vibrate vibration plate like the ones Life Pro makes really help the lymphatic system? If so, how many minutes do you recommend a day? Um, so and you could have something hereditary or it could be just that your style of eating was the same as your father. Um, and so you started getting swelling um, as you got older. Yes, our lymphatics age as well. Um, and uh, I did a lot of work and there's actually been some study um, uh, by using vibration plates with lipedema, but I don't know that they've done it with lymphedema specifically, but anecdotally hearing really good stuff with losing fluid, increasing bone density, um, you know, improving um, your lean mass um, and, and lots of great things happen with vibration. Um, I can't tell you how many minutes or, or what setting to do it because everybody is so different. And of course, there's there's a few um, cautions on that. Like if you have a metal plate in, you know, a knee replacement. I mean, there's some couple of cautions that you need to take. Um, I think that the um, Life Pro website is excellent and gives a lot of information. And they got um, a lot of exercises up there too that you can do with it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so look at that. Um, I, I, sorry, I can't give you more guidance than that, except for that the, the anecdotal reports are fabulous. 
Um, thank you for taking the time with us. Hey, it's been fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> once when I got a mess, a, I think a massage, um, the therapist suggested a lymphatic massage, but can't find a therapist in my area. Also, when I get a pedicure, it really hurts when she massages my leg. That kind of sensitivity and tenderness, tenderness to touch could be lipedema. It could be that you're just so swollen that it becomes tender when you're so swollen. I always have held fluid in my legs. I've been carnivore for four months, not losing weight very easily, as most people say they are. Could lymphedema be my problem? And could that also be causing my high blood pressure, um, which is not aided by blood pressure meds? What can I do to help? And so um, I, I would I would actually go to a, a carnivore coach to see um, exactly, I mean, uh, for instance, my style of carnivore is that anything animal sourced. If it's with it from an animal, I eat it. But some people don't do well with eggs. Some people don't do well with dairy. I mean, so there's a lot fewer foods in a carnivore lifestyle that you would probably have an intolerance to, but you still could have a problem with some. And so I've, working with a professional, you might find what is going to be um, you know, a way of tweaking, tweaking the diet that is particularly suited to you. I think dairy inflames the three of us as well. So we have to stay away from dairy. Keep away. Yeah. yeah. And if we have a central lymphatic issue and um, and you're, um, you might need to do some of these other uh, interventions that um, we showed um, in that slide, um, because it's a diet is a big part of it, but it probably isn't going to be the whole thing that's going to manage that. And so it may be that you still have a lot of fluid that's not able to be processed to your trunk like it should. And so adding a rebounder, a vibration, um, um, you know, uh, taking something that can reduce the viscosity of your lymph, um, you know, a variety of these interventions, doing a fast, eating the apple cider vinegar, um, you might need something else besides the diet and you want to have a professional help. Great. Todd, if you want to start doing uh, start questions. Okay, perfect. We're ready to go with those. Here we go. Um, okay, we'll show a couple of these. Appreciate the new members. Thank you so mm -hmm. much for the support. Yeah, yeah. And we will come on down here. Here's another one. Oh, wow. Thank you so much for gifting a membership. I sure appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. Let's see. Sandra, uh, I am so grateful to all of you just watching. Helps uh, keep me on track. Thank you so much. We appreciate you, Sandra. Mm -hmm. to the next one. Cool. Uh, Sherry, hi, all. Thank you for this interview. It's so important. Oh, I got you. We're going to rifle through these ones, get to the questions. Great topic mm -hmm. tonight. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Sorry, we're a little bit behind. There's so much good. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Question. I lost 100 pounds in 2017, reversed nice. my type 2, uh, gained it all back. Now I've been carnivore since June 1st. Okay. Weighed three, 300 pounds. Haven't lost anything. I don't understand why. I've been B, 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 and E. Why? Well, yeah. that's a big question, but it could be a lot of things. Um like, do you have any seasonings? Are you under eating? Under eating was a big one for me. Um, what do you think, Lindy? Yeah, under eating for me was a big one as well. So I had to do a bit of timing and, yeah, and that sort of kick-started my metabolism and it started to drop the weight again. But definitely I consider joining SBG Gang, Steak and Butter Gang. I think Michael will have a link there. And, um, yeah, just just being in a community helps. Um, also, Meet Sisters, we have a community there just for women. It's a private group, so you can post uh, in there and you'll get a lot of support and help in there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, I would suggest, could you even check, um, have some blood work done? Um, are you um, eating really good, but you're not metabolizing it? Um, mm -hmm. Do you have hypothyroid Um so, you know, you won't lose anything when you have low thyroid, but also be um, having multiple uh, ways of seeing how your body is changing. You may not have lost anything on the scale, but your clothes are fitting different. Um, your skin is healthier. Your hair is healthier. So um, 
be sure to have multiple ways of doing it. And I think that all comes with um, a community, like you're saying, Lindy. Absolutely. That composition changes. So it's like until you experience it, you can't even imagine it because I lost, I gained 21 pounds and lost three shirt sizes. Like uh -huh. it's just in incredible. So yes, yes. that's an absolute great point. Um, question I have both. However, my lymphedema therapist says I can't be in pain with this. What can I take uh, her to her? What can I take her to help her understand? I have both and I am in pain. So um, this is unfortunately um, a lot of the lymphedema training uh, 20 or so years ago. So if this is a long, a therapist who's been there a long time, we originally were told, were told that lymphedema doesn't hurt. Well, guess what? It hurts. Some people, I mean, I, I definitely have had someone come in after breast cancer treatment and an arm that's ginormous. And they said, no, nah, it's not really a problem. Um, and then someone who is only this big and they're saying it really hurts like crazy. So it really, it doesn't matter with size. Um, it, and some people are super tender, like Mike just said that it hurts. It hurts. So you definitely can have pain with lymphedema. Um, so I, I think I, I would send them to maybe to the Learn website. Um, that's, uh, I got to look it up for you um, to get you that. But it's the Lymphatic Education and Research Network. They talk about pain associated with, with lymphedema. I think it's lymphatic lymphaticresearch.org or something like that. I have to look it up, but, yeah, um, you know, if you go to any, yes, yes. Excellent. So go, you know, uh, give that link to your lymphedema therapist. You definitely can have pain with lymphedema. Now it's pretty much just about everybody with lipedema has pain. Um, yeah. so that is, maybe she's thinking that your or the therapist is thinking that, um, that that's, lipedema not lymphedema but not so Let's see question how long does it take to heal insulin resistance and lymphedema lipedema lymphedema now um lymphedema and lipedema are chronic lymphatic conditions and for most people that have had it um for an extended period of time we're talking years there is some um, damage that's done that may not be reversible. Um, you may get away with not needing compression as much or not as high level of a compression uh, garment, you know, not as tight, um, not as firm. Um, with diet and changing the way you eat, you might, um, you definitely will, will reduce in size. Um, it will be easier to manage it but it doesn't necessarily ever go away completely. It's, it's something that um, your tissue may be irreversibly damaged already. Now, insulin resistance, on the other hand, that can go away. What do you think about insulin resistance? So I follow Jason Fung's uh, kind of theory that the best, and that's why I do so much fasting, that the best way to heal it is, especially your fasted insulin set point, well, uh, which I very much believe in because I kind of feel like I've experienced it uh -huh. is to hold it, you know, as low and as long as possible as for as many collective hours as you can. So that's why I do 84 hour fast to, for the autophagy and to hold that insulin down low, uh -huh. Uh -huh. you know? Yeah. Yeah. But the second you have too many carbs, it, it can come right back. And I or, think that might be for the person who said that she lost a whole bunch of weight on keto carnivore, but gain it all back. And now the second time around, she's trying to do it. I think if it, when you um, when you go back and forth a lot, it, it seems to be, for whatever reason, harder the next time. And I think it is because you reverse some of that healing that you did on the, on the insulin resistance. And um, I've had lots of patients that it was so easy the first time, dropped the, the sugar cravings, lost a lot of weight, the lymphedema was better, but then got, you know, fell off the wagon, gained it back and they, okay, I'm ready to do it again. And now it is way harder. And it, it might have to do with that insulin resistance that um, it doesn't like you going back and forth like that. So. Yeah. Yeah. That makes so much sense too. Cause I hit a stall and I talked to Ken Berry about it. 
And I was like, what do you think this is? And he's like, look, you lost 270 pounds now. He's like, your body's kind of freaked out. And, you know, <laughs> nowhere, nowhere in history, you know, normally would that happen? You lost like a big person and a half. So your body's just wanting to chill out. So I got to thinking about that yo-yo stuff too, because yeah. I think your body just kind of wigs out and it wants to see what's real. And the more you do that, the more time it's going to kind of stall and wait to see what you're really doing. Yeah, before. I'm not sure if I trust you here. I yeah, think I'm exactly. going to hold on to this because I don't right. know. Yeah, yeah. Right, because this environment is crazy. Like all of a sudden it's yeah. and sugar and whatever, and then we're in some famine, and then it's fat and meat, and I think it really wigs it out. So yeah, yeah. I think it makes a lot of sense. Exactly. For Dr. Phil, he, he's awesome. He's a physician too. And yeah, I, I truly honestly believe that I might be crazy, but I've just watched it in my own family. And I think insulin resistant babies are directly linked to the diet of the mother and how much, you know, because yes. my, my mom is hyperglycemic too, by the mm -hmm. way, which is really fun. Yeah. Yeah. And I do, and there, there has been research that shows that, that those uh, kids that um, were the, the mother had, um, gestational diabetes, they are much at higher risk, much more predisposed to being obese themselves later in life. Yeah. But calories don't matter. It could be calories in, you know, Snickers bars, or it could be calories in lettuce or meat. That doesn't matter. Big food wants us to think, you know, yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, question, been carnivore four months. I have high blood pressure and very big legs, which is not reducing. Doctor gave me blood pressure meds, uh, which is not working, what can I do to help my blood pressure? Yeah. So, um, well, first, are you getting any support for carnivore from your doctor? Because I really think that this is a really important piece. Um, if your doctor does not understand this way of eating, they are going to try to, to fix everything the way they've traditionally done it by giving you pills. I mean, it's pills or surgery, right? So, um, I would really consider, even if you have to pay out of pocket, to do a consult with a, um, a like someone from the Society for Metabolic Health Practitioners. A lot of them do virtual consults. Um, we have specialists in there like cardiologists or naturopaths or, um, you know, uh, obesity medicine specialists or whatever. But they understand diet and they can help you better with this. Um, you need someone who is who uh, will understand all of your medical conditions and know how diet influences that. It may be that we just have to tweak your carnivore diet. Um, something else is going on in there. Um, and, and your doctor doesn't sound like they're cognizant of diet. And so they're not really helping you with it. What do you guys think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my cardiologist, after I lost you know, 205 pounds, got off oxygen and was off all medication. That was the first time he told me that he was worried about my diet. Nobody ever mentioned it when I was in six months earlier, I was in the hospital for 11 days wow. getting fluid pumped off of me where they told me I had congestive heart failure and COVID yes. one. Yes. They never mentioned diet to me. Yes. Six months later, I'm off all the medication. I'm out of the chair and mobile again. Yes. Off oxygen. I feel great. My doctor said, what are you doing? I said, carnivore. And he goes, I'm worried about your diet. And that's when I haven't, I haven't talked to doctors since I'm like, I'm done no. with you people. You're crazy. Yes. You know? Yes. Yes. So I a hundred percent agree. Yeah. yeah. I, I had one patient who was in my little keto and, and uh, lymphedema and obesity study. And just like you, she had, you know, decreased pain, decreased weight, uh, decreased fat uh, on the body composition, uh, more energy, um, all these things, all fabulous. And her doctor told her, um, wow, I'm, I'm so glad you're doing so wonderful, but could you add a few more plants to your diet? Right. <laughs> right. Why? We're not ruminant animals. We don't have four stomachs yeah. to process, yeah. uh, to process all the fiber. We're not getting out of it what they pretend like <laughs> we're getting out of it anyways. It's right. like, why? <laughs> oh. and I'm a dog electrician from montana and i know that now how did it you know how 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 i just don't understand yeah i lost 300 pounds on um carnivore and all my bloods were looking amazing doctor was really pleased with me and then she says oh when you fail here's my card come and see me for bariatric surgery all right when you fail when i fail oh my gosh 
300 pounds yeah. as kicking goals. And yes. yeah. Yes. Does he know that you already had a lap band and that's what failed? Carnivore isn't failing you. The lap band failed you. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And then I, I just went and had a consultation with a skin surgeon and he says, oh, you've lost so much weight. How did you do that? Were you vegan? I said, no, carnivore. And he goes, oh, um, Ozempic? And I'm like, no, carnivore. And he says, oh, would you like Ozempic? <laughs> no. <laughs> so crazy. Um, is there any other reason for no artificial sweeteners other than it can cause a response in some people? My daughter is still using some. Yeah. For some people, it's really a valuable bridge to, you know, you're used to those really sweet foods. And there's no way you can do keto or carnivore if you don't still get that sweetness. It's like a no, it's, it's already dead in the water. And so that helps some people transition, but then eventually we want you to get off of it because, um, and again, this is anecdotal information, but it seems that in our lymphatic community that it increases inflammation and is contributing to pain. And so we've had a lot of people that have eliminated eventually um, their artificial sweeteners and regular sweeteners, <laughs> anything sweeteners, they've um, because it seems to help them with their pain symptom. Um, definitely people can get an insulin response from them and it can cause a weight loss stall. I mean, there's a variety of things that can happen with them. Um, so um, we, we recommend that eventually that's the place you want to be that you don't have any of those, or maybe as an occasional treat, but not something you have daily. Think about that, but it is, um, especially for lymphatic disorders, it might be an, an issue. Is there a sweetener that you would recommend if you did have to take something? Is there something that you yeah. would recommend or? So usually I, I say to, to use like a stevia, um, it's not um, a manufactured uh, sweetener like aspartame. Although, you know, now we're getting new stuff out about aspartame and maybe it's not as bad as we thought. But um, if you're if you're finding that you're not meeting your goals, if you're finding that your pain is not going down like you want, your weight is not going down like you want, um, then that might be something to consider is to cut out that and see if then then you achieve your goals or you seem to be moving in that direction better. Um, it's it's something that we don't have a whole lot of data on, and you got to see what is going to be best for you. Everybody's different, right? Yeah. yeah. Me, I can do the artificial sweetener. I, can, I didn't. I didn't have what Lindy calls the off switch or food freedom until I got away from all sweet palates. Um, and also, I know that all the artificial sweeteners. I was a stevia person. Wrecks my gut microbiome. So it really screwed things up, especially mm -hmm. for leptin sensitivity and citation. You know, hormones. Mm -hmm. That was not good when I was on it. Mm -hmm. And the, but the biggest thing was anxiety. Right, the anxiety was still around when I had those things in my gut. And I really believe that everything that made me have an addictive personality and be compulsive was anxiety. Whatever that connection was, yes, that pushed it 110%. Because like, like I've said before, but when I, when I quit all that stuff and I got rid of the anxiety and I got no I completely over all the cravings of everything free from it all, I wasn't even trying to, but I quit a 26 year nicotine habit I didn't mm -hmm. want it anymore and it was gone. And yes. I, a gambling addiction that was still a monkey on my back, I wasn't doing it anymore, had it had it under control for a long time, but the urge was still there after yes. 10 years. Yes. That went away. Yes. So that and that didn't happen until I got rid of all the all yeah. the stuff. I had to go real clean. I had I don't drink caffeine or any of that stuff mm -hmm. anymore, just water and you know just pro animal fat and protein and that's it and that actually mm -hmm. sounds so restrictive but it's the most freeing thing i've ever experienced in my yes. life actually yes yes yeah. yeah so move on question i just like uh nothing allergies can you what is it yeah allergies so can you note a dextrose or a medicine or medical record? Oh, so yeah, just like in putting, noting allergies in your medical record, you want, you can make these other notations and, and um, you know, particularly with your surgeon, if you're having a planned surgery, I'm going to go in and have a hip replacement or something like that. And okay. so prior to your, your uh, visit prior to the surgery, 
um, please have it in my record that I um, want saline IV only, no dextrose. I mean, if it's not in there, the, the nursing staff is only going to follow what the surgeon has put in the note. And so those types of things, um, if you know, talk with your um, your surgeon prior to that. Um, it's it's harder once you are like it's, it's an emergency thing. Uh, Mike goes in the hospital with his infection, <laughs> and now you're just you're in the hospital and there's been no planning. So um, hopefully you have friends and family that can um, back you up in those situations, and they can communicate. You you should never be getting medical care without an advocate. And I heard a physician say this on a, a radio interview. He said, even when I'm sick, I have someone with me when I go to see the doctor, when I'm in the hospital, someone has to advocate for you because you're in a place where you, you can't think straight and you can't say a lot of times what you need. Someone has to be there who's on your side. Um, so make sure that you have, you know, some designated people that know that you don't want any dextrose in your IV. <laughs> oh, I got to, I got, we're going to jump ahead to uh, a super chat. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Adam from Carnivore Today. And, uh, uh, you know, Adam very well. That's how we met you. Adam hooked us up. <laughs> so <It is. laughs> Thank you yeah. so much, Adam. We appreciate it. This is, I, I'm finding this, this is a, the best show for me that we've ever done. This is the answers we've been wanting. So Definitely is, yeah. we sure appreciate you coming on. This is so awesome. I'm going to link uh, her interview with Adam on his channel too. And, uh, Absolutely. Excellent. Um, question, what will help if I had three horizontal surgeries at lower abdomen that damage uh, uh, to the limb system? Yeah. So when we have... Uh, it's, it's really important um, which direction your scar is. Um, and so if you have that, like um, that, it looks almost like a smile going across the, the base of your abdomen. A lot of times it, it, it is a functional dam and it can cause lots of water retention. And so having um, a, you know, this kind of uh, vertical scar, fluid can still get out. Um, it's not gonna be blocked by that. And so um, and going to, again, I would see a, a, a lymphedema therapist because we do lots of manual techniques and we will do scar reduction massage and maybe even some modalities on you like cupping and uh, 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 cold laser techniques and various things like that to try to reduce that scar and then it will influence, it will have less of an impact, less of an influence on the lymphatics and allow them to drain. So see a, see a therapist um, and have help with those scars. Awesome. Um, question, compressing stockings, helping for upper thighs, but two inches above elbows, shoe shoulder, what do I do? Compression badger shirt, uh, not doing much. Yeah. So when you have when you have a larger and um, unusual shape, then quite often we have to go to custom garments. But again, I like starting with Velcro first to see what your tolerance is to compression. Because as we're talking about some people, um, you apply compression that helps on the limb and it just pushes it into the trunk and the trunk gets big and uncomfortable. So um, so we really want to see how how effective we want those garments to be. They should always be comfortable, but maybe we don't want them so strong that we just put fluid in a different part of your body without letting it get processed and get rid of it. So um, when, when you're talking to me about the shape and, and how things are not staying in, in the, the right place, they're shifting, they're probably wrinkling, they're you know drifting down and, and bunching up, that type of thing. It, it really uh, says that you might need something we call flat knit garment. It's custom. It's built just for you. Um, and consider um, using a Velcro product. And sometimes we even layer it. We put the custom flat knit garment onto the limb and then we layer on top of that a Velcro product, at least on the um, arm and also on the lower leg. It's very hard to get those Velcro products to stay in place on the thighs. 
They just mm -hmm. don't. Uh, now I've had some people be very creative and they actually took an abdominal binder and just slap that on their thigh while they're sitting down. Mm -hmm. hey, you know, if it works, I've, it's, I've it's it before. Yeah. And it, boy, it's a lot cheaper than the, you know, just going. very hard to get on by yourself. Let me tell you. Yes. Yes. <laughs> very hard to get on by yourself and don't try walking in it. Oh um, yeah. Slides down. Yeah, but but be creative. I've had my patients. Um, I had this one uh, patient in his 80s. He couldn't get his stockings on, so he you know what he used was KY jelly. <laughs> it slid <laughs> right on. His, his 80 something year old wife was very embarrassed going into the pharmacy to buy it for him, but it worked. So right. you know, do what do what works. That's funny. For to get actually. creative. Yep. <laughs> Is this condition avoidable or but not reversible? Once you've gotten a large fat nodule, can they be reduced uh, or reduced away? Yeah, yes. So it's not avoidable. Some people, even though they do everything perfectly, they might still get lymphedema. Um, lipedema may be, I think, totally avoidable if we raise our girls from day one on keto and carnivore. <laughs> Um, but uh, lymphedema, it, it may be completely unavoidable if you're born with an imperfectly formed lymphatic system. Um, and once you get a really large fat nodule, some of them have to be surgically excised. That, that's just an option that should be out there. Um, and then others can be reduced um, just by how you eat and applying comfortable compression. So um, you certainly can um, uh, reduce and manage and change those things, but sometimes surgery might need to be still on the table. That makes, uh, that, that's, well, I guess now it's good enough time. I, so I have one nodule left on my left calf and it's kind of like I have a dead spot between it and the muscle now because it it's just kind of more on the skin and I lost so much weight around the calf mm -hmm. that I'm looking at it and I'm like, I, everybody that says that I should get as lean as possible. So I'm trying to, before I ever get skin surgery, I want to get as lean as possible before I get skin surgery. But I'm looking at that dang thing and I'm like, I feel like just cutting you off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, just, because that, there is a change that happens to the tissue and the skin. And, and this is documented with ultrasounds. It becomes thicker. And so, uh, and I do think that the way we eat can reverse that a bit, but some of it, it's, it's sometimes, I, I, another therapist that I work with, he called it on this one patient, the, the patient even called it her brain that was on her calf, this yeah. gnarly tissue of thickened yeah. tissue. Um, it, and it had been there so long that, you know, she was doing everything perfectly. The therapists were doing everything perfectly. And they finally did just have it excised. It's exactly um, so, what I have going on. It's yeah. purple. It has the craziest thick skin on it. Mm -hmm. And my whole leg from my knee to my ankle all the way around was had this thick, dead, like brown and green skin on it that felt like like one of those rawhide chew toys you give to the dog. Mm -hmm. Like it was so thick. That took a year for me to get that off there. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it's finally off except for in one spot on that nodule on the back, that hard, hard, just dead skin is there. And I cannot get that off to save my life. I can peel it off, but then it just leaks and goes to open flesh. I'd be careful. Yeah, you, know? you need to have it surgically done and then closed it. You know, peeling it off is, it, it is, it just turns into more scar tissue. You know, just keloid more. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's what that is. That's good to know because I was looking at it. I was like, I sure hope I can just get the, you cut off. And get you yeah, out of yeah. And, and the way that you're, you know, you're reducing the swelling, you're eating while your tissue is healthier. You're in it now in a very good place to have the procedure. Whereas okay. before you probably would be in the hospital with an infection and a wound that wouldn't close. For sure. Yeah. Finally, you know, I, I, it, this is another question. <laughs> I have so many questions on this because it's just absolutely pummeled me my whole life, but uh -huh. I had a bunch of neuropathy, which I think was from the lymphedema because I couldn't move my toes individually. And it, that was one of the first things that came back when all that swelling came off my legs, uh -huh. my legs were on fire and burned for about six weeks. And it felt uh -huh. like my feet were in frying pans for six uh -huh. solid weeks. Yes. But then after that healed up, I could move my toes individually again. And I got feeling back on my legs. Uh -huh. So uh, what I'm wondering is, is that, you know, 
Is that what that was from? Was from the lymphedema? Was it just starving blood flow from the nerves or what was happening? Possibly. It's probably a combination of things. Um, there is something about stagnant fluid that's very irritating to nerve endings, particularly sensory nerves. Um, and uh, so they can not only deaden the feeling, but alter the feeling. Um, the cruelest thing is to have less sensation, to feel kind of numbish, but also have pain. You know, you think that, okay, I, I, I would just want to be away from the pain. I'll, I'll accept numb if I didn't have pain, but that's not how it works. It's like, that's the one sensation that still gets through. And so part of it is just having that stagnant fluid that is irritating. Um, and also the, the immobility. We think about the, the physiological need for having swelling. You break your arm. You're running away from that saber tooth tiger and you fall and you break your arm. And so it splints that area by making it swell. So you can't move anything anymore. It's split. So that's a function of the swelling, but now it's there for a long time and you start, you know, you lose that mobility and, and it, it hurts to start. So your toes were so swollen that mm -hmm. you try to wiggle them and they're all stiff and yep. they're painful. And so you start getting some of that swelling out. Now they can move more freely um, that's usually the, the, one of the first things that people say is I can see between my toes. <laughs> oh yeah. My, I got, I got my toes back. Exactly. Seriously. Yeah. Like that was crazy. Somebody said it perfect. They're like, my feet look like blown up rubber gloves. And I'm like, yeah, that's exactly yeah. correct. Yes. Yes. Yeah, totally. Um, but, but so that burning sensation, I was just assuming it was actually like my nature just said, I think this is a good thing. I think my nerves are starting to feel again. I think they're actually yeah. healing. Yeah, but, but I, there is, um, I, I'm just now starting to get into the study of neurolymphatics, and um, there is drainage that happens along your nerves. So I'm just wondering if there is some crazy messages that are um, going back to your brain. Um, we're getting some kind of inflammatory response, you're getting that heat and that redness, you're getting that pain. Um, and maybe it's a process that you have to go through to heal. I'm not entirely sure, but I do think that you are on the right track that it probably has something to do with the lymphatics. Makes sense because, you know, it, clearly when the swelling went down, the nerves started coming back and, yeah. and it was a good sign. So, yeah. Uh, interesting about the trunk damage. My lymphedema or lipedema went uh, nuts after unplanned yes. C section. Yes. Yeah. My legs had always been bad, but my arms and stomach got uh, lipedema where I didn't have it before. Yes. Yeah. So the um, three most common triggering periods for women with lipedema is it starts at puberty, pregnancy, menopause. Um, these also happen to be times that are, are physiological, natural periods of insulin resistance. Um, but it's also times that your, your hormone levels change. Um, and I think that also the, um, the, um, you can get some trunk damage just by pregnancy, um, cause there's an awful lot of moving the organs around and stretching tissue, but then you throw into that a surgery, you know, a C-section. So there was more opportunity for having, um, stuff. So you, you like to have multiple things going on, um, in, in that situation, that um, all those things could really cause your lipidema to really take off. Makes a lot of sense. Here we go. My upper arm is two, three inches bigger around than my left upper arm. Mm -hmm. My right upper arm is two to three round inches. Uh, recommendations? So um, definitely to go see a, a lymphedema therapist, a certified lymphedema therapist and get that treatment get um, your diet squared away the way that works for you. Um, you're going to see that decrease in inflammation. And I mean, that's the big thing is that we try to, um, we're, we're making you more symmetrical as we're improving the health of your tissue and your skin. So I do think um, if you have this, particularly if you can find a, a therapist that um, believes in incorporating diet into the, um, into their practice, I think um, I, you can have some some help with that. 
Absolutely. I mean, that's what I spent 25 years doing These people who came in with one arm is bigger than the other. <laughs> that's awesome. Here we go. Uh, can you use a massage gun? Uh, will it cause damage? So that is very individual. So, um, so just keep in mind, you should never cause yourself pain. And for some people, those massage guns can be very painful, probably then not a good thing, but they can help reduce fibrosis. And you think about, you have less scar scarring in your tissues, things are going to flow out of there a lot easier. So they definitely can be beneficial for some people. Be very cautious. This is kind of a nuanced question, but <laughs> so beginning carnivore, eat uh, more protein, then fat, then take vinegar. <laughs> for some people, like for some people, it, it, I, I really recommend that um, you can do lots of uh, experimentation. You can watch this show <laughs> and see what things to try. You can get a coach. Um, you can get a, a actual physician um, or other healthcare provider that, you know, is trained in this way of eating. Um, sometimes, I mean, doing it by yourself is, can take a long time to figure out what works for you. And what you recommend there, Carol, may be perfect for someone, but maybe not for you. <laughs> and so um, being part of a community and seeing, well, what should I try with? And just try one thing at a time, because then you don't know, otherwise you don't know which one worked. So try one thing at a time, see how you do, or get a coach and have that person help guide you for your situation. What they think from their experience might work best for you. It's hard for me to tell you, Carol, exactly what you should do, but that's one of the things that people can do that it worked for time. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's great advice because I totally agree with that because I think the true, you know, there's a few real key things that I think the carnivore diet does one it, one, you have to, I, I really truly believe the best way to do carnivore is to be very, very strict and eliminate just about everything. Get down to just a few simple things. Even if you want to open it up to more carnivore stuff, as soon as you can get it simple, then it's a perfect elimination diet to add things back in one at a time and see how it affects you. First yes. of all, that's super handy. <laughs> but then the other is to be in that community because people yes. want this like, real one size fits all ABC right. plan and it yeah. doesn't exist. I've yeah. never seen it exist. They anybody. expect results the same day and it's not going to happen. It takes yeah. Time. That's not going to happen either. It does happen quicker though. I mean, I'm here to tell you I've only been doing it 17 months and I, I am. You guys, a, are, you guys are amazing. I, I've never seen such a spectacular short term results, but everybody watching has to realize that that may not happen for you. Everybody responds differently, but in general, just about everybody is going to benefit from reducing their carbohydrates, from getting the right level of fat, um, from maybe taking a little bit of uh, 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 vinegar or doing fasting. We, we try to find out the right combination that's going to be pleasurable, enjoyable, <laughs> um, but Something also that you want to do each day. You want to be effective. Um, you want to, life is is meant to be enjoyed. <laughs> so, sure. yeah. Even even this process, you enjoy this process too. Yes. I finally to the point yes. where I know this is so sustainable because I'm actually really enjoying this process. I'm enjoying these conversations. I'm enjoying yeah. finding stuff out and making new breakthroughs. And that's one beautiful thing about this because, you know, when you're going through this, there's so many questions that you definitely do need to be in a community where you can ask people. That's what, that's why I love the SBG gang so much is because mm -hmm. nobody has anything to sell you. There's no agendas, mm -hmm. it's a bunch of people that are trying to save their life and, and have a higher quality of life. And they're like, this is happening. I don't know why I help. And then 10 people will be like, well, that was happening for me. And I did this X, Y, or Z. Right. And you'll find one of those that work and you're not crazy. You know, right. When you start going, I think this is happening when I do this. Like for me, it was when I was eating chicken. I was like, am I crazy or is chicken making me sick? And chicken makes me terrible sick. And there's a whole bunch of people that chicken makes sick, you know? So it's so, yeah, it's so important to get into a, a good group. And I think the SBG is one of the best. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Should I drink lots of water? <laughs> I, I have always been governed by thirst. That's a great feedback system. And so I think it's unreasonable to tell everybody you, be, you should be drinking X sure. amount of water. Um, because for some people, I mean, you can you can make yourself sick from drinking too much water. And of course, I don't want you to be dehydrated. But um, and, and for some people, they don't have that good thirst response. Right. Or making the, they have some medication they're on that makes them thirsty and maybe they don't really need water, but they feel that thirst. So you can't always rely on that mechanism. But. I think it's unreasonable. Some um, groups really promote that you need to have drink X liters of water per day. And, and I just don't think we can make that blanket recommendation for people, um, you know, based on certain weight means this many liters or something like that. Um, it, what, what do you guys usually talk about in relation to water? So I have a way up and down relationship with it because I was drinking a ton of it. Mm -hmm. I like two and a half gallons a day. I was, I couldn't drink enough water. It was pretty crazy. Yeah. And, and then I upped my fat. And what I found out is, is that fat, there's a plenty of research behind it that more fat that you eat, uh, the, the more stable your electrolytes will be. Mm -hmm. So I found that out to be, so I went from drinking like two and a half gallons a day to going down to like 60 ounces a day mm -hmm. uh, and doing the dry fasting and now, uh, now I just listen to my thirst and it's not off the Richter scale like that. So I drink somewhere between 60 ounces and maybe a gallon and a little over a day now. And right. I find that that's my sweet spot, but I definitely was drinking. I almost feel too much for whatever reason. I don't know why I was doing that, but mm -hmm. could have been a crutch or something. What do you think, Lindy? Uh, well, I've got my bone broth. I do that every morning. It's a pretty large cup. And then at nighttime, I'll have the peppermint tea through the day occasionally take a sip of a drink i normally carry a bottle around but i don't drink a lot and i never have my my whole life i've been very bad with well, the even when you were eating a, a higher carb diet you di didn't drink a lot then either no no but sometimes at night time i'd feel really dehydrated i'd get a headache mm -hmm. so then i'd make up for it at night and i'd be yes. guzzling two or three well, yes. back then probably soft drink something really bad um mm -hmm. But now, nowadays, I just have the two. I make sure I have my morning drink. I like something warm. And then at nighttime as well. And then through the day, if I remember, I try to, to take a sip. But, um, yeah, I haven't been a very, very good with my water. <laughs> Should drink I, a lot. For me, I drink when I'm thirsty. I, I like my coffee in the morning. And then I probably drink probably 60 to 80 ounces in a day. I don't have a set amount that I drink. I just... Yeah. Playing. Yes. Yeah. I, I did find that I um, was always thirsty and I had to have something to drink with a meal when I was eating a high carb diet. But now on, well, even on keto and before I went to carnivore, um, I rarely, I, it's like, oh, okay. So right now we're talking about drinking water. So I have my drink right here. <laughs> it makes right. me thirsty. Right? Um, yeah. But it, it just didn't even feel thirst as much anymore when I got off the carbs. Right. You know, talking about this now, I, I don't drink when, when I eat dinner no more. Do you guys drink something when you're eating? No. I do. I do. I have have to. A drink with a meal. You're yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. Now, before, yeah, I had to have a pop or something to drink with, with my yeah. meal, almost with every bite. Yes. Now yes. I don't drink at all when I'm eating my meals. Yes. Yeah, I wait till I force myself to wait till the right. end. Till yeah, you want to get filled up on the food, yeah. You know, and I don't want to dilute it, so I try to wait 25 minutes after I take oh. my last bite. So, okay. but it's it's hard. I, I'm a drinker. I always have been. I put, I gained all my weight by drinking soda. That's what oh. I put all the weight on. Mm -hmm. For yeah. sure. I've still got the lap band restriction. If I drink, I can't eat. So everything will get stuck. So it's best that I don't do anything until mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. So that's probably why I don't drink a lot. Mm -hmm. Low in copper, so much information. Thank you, guys. Yeah, yeah. this is um, um, very common with the people we've been able to identify for sure as having a uh, dysfunction in their central lymphatics and their trunk lymphatics, they're low copper. So I, I was actually thinking about getting a copper cup and drinking my fluid out of that. Oh, how interesting. Yeah. yeah. I, I never thought of that. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. 
that literally michael that just came up and uh, uh with another group that i was talking to and they're like they started drinking in those moscow mule copper cups mm -hmm. to get mm -hmm. the copper and what is so crazy about this is i never considered that i'd be low copper because i'm an electrician and i absorb copper through the wire that i touch all yeah. the time yeah but you're not out in the field anymore bud not anymore i really yeah. haven't touched copper right years since i've been, I've been yeah. out of the field but i just wouldn't have thought but maybe it is maybe that's literally something that's going on there i, I got a copper cup in my, in my thing i was actually thinking about getting one so i figured i could probably be low on copper yeah that's funny it would be interesting if if you are one of those people that likes getting blood tests just for the fun of it um and see what your levels are now um, although it is very very hard to, to check for copper um, but get one now and then try that drinking out of the copper cup and see, see what it does. A little citizen science thing. I'll do that for sure because I'm, we're getting ready to go get blood for uh, Hack Your Health. I'm trying to do an 18 month before and after, mm -hmm. uh, mainly looking at thyroid and uh, testosterone because I had terrible low testosterone stuff. But uh, I'll, so I'll definitely try that and try the copper uh, mm -hmm. supplement. Do they make copper supplements you can just take more so than the copper? I think so. I'm not. I'm not particularly. I haven't checked on that, so I don't know. Look into it. Uh, question. I'm a bit confused. Oh, yeah, this is kind of like that last question. Question. I'm a bit confused. Are we saying we need more protein and fat initially, and that uh, when starting carnivore, if we have lymphedema, I th oh, edema? Uh, so, I used no, we're know. we're not saying that at all. It, because everybody has got, has got to find out um, uh, what they need. Um, at, are you guys familiar with Siobhan Huggins? Mm. She yeah. works with Dave Feldman and she actually has lipedema herself. And so she's done a lot of uh, when on carnivore, she's looked at, are you someone who needs to be low fat, high protein or the reverse when you're on carnivore? I mean, cause that, that's basically, that's very low carbohydrate unless you're eating some dairy. Um, and so you're basically your two macros are protein and, and fat, but some people need to be higher fat and some people do better with higher protein and then you change. And then sometimes now you're in this part of your life that you need this way. So um, she said that you really have to experiment and see what works best for you. Um, it, it's, it's unfortunately, it's hard to know, um, you know, what exactly is going to work best for you, even though you if you bloat with carbs, doesn't necessarily mean that you're a um, someone has a central lymphatic problem. Everybody bloats with carbs. That's what they do to us. But if you tend to bloat whenever you eat fat, maybe it'd be better for you to have higher protein, let your lymphatics heal, and then maybe try the reverse. It takes a lot of experimentation. Guys, and somebody explained it to me and made a whole lot of sense to me. The reason why... This was kind of interesting, but he said, you know what we're finding is that people with a compromised lymphatic system, when they start carnivore, they start healing their body. And so they can get away with having a lot of lean protein. But then what happens is, is that your path, your, your uh, metabolic pathway for gluconeogenesis heals faster than your lymphatic system does. And so you start taking and turning that excess protein into glucose, spiking your insulin and it mm -hmm. causes a little bit of a, a hitchy hiccup. And I don't know if that's true, but I did start mm -hmm. watching my ketones better. And I found out that when I did that, I had to lower my protein intake to about 60 per me 60 grams of protein or less per meal, mm -hmm. or else I would spike new uh, gluconeogenesis and I'd have an insulin increase, which mm -hmm. I never used to have before. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of an interesting. Yeah. Point. So it, it, you change over time. Yeah. So it, it is something that, um, uh, I mean, we get, we're, we're, we have a lot of habits and I mean, I'm good with the same meal, you know, every day. So, and, and I don't need a lot of variety. I, and even those people who eat a high carb diet, they have oatmeal every morning. They have a sandwich for lunch. And I mean, they eat those same meals, but they think that they're having a lot more variety than I do. Um, so but then you notice that I'm having the same thing. I'm doing the same thing I did. And then something's different. I'll always right. say I'm getting a bloaty belly or whatever. So then you got to mix things up and, and try something different. Um, so what you figure out is right for you right now may not be right for you two years from now. 
Yeah. Absolutely. Definitely. That's why I don't make how to do carnivore videos because I made mm -hmm. one and I disagreed with myself four weeks later. So. <laughs> it changed. <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> Exactly. I learned learned my lesson. Four weeks later, I was like, "Listen to this idiot." <laughs> Let's see. What if I have a pacemaker? I've read that you shouldn't use a vibration plate. Um, yeah, pacemaker. you're right. You're right. Um, so there are. If you go to, for instance, I mean, I'm not promoting a certain project uh, product, but the Life Pro website, they will tell you all the contraindications. Um, for using a vibration plate. And one of those I do believe is a pacemaker. <laughs> so um, your heart is a wonderful thing and you want to protect it. So um, so check that out. Um, you, will, you may not be able to, to use a vibration plate. Good information. Uh, I've never heard of the Velcro kind. Where can I get them? I think he's talking about the compression ones, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I, I can tell you a, a website to go to. Again, I don't know if you guys are, you know, promote certain businesses, stuff like that. But um, there um, I, I use a, a, a website, uh, compressionguru.com, and they have all the different different brands of various things. And they have um, several different companies, Velcro products, and they make a Velcro product for the leg. Um, and also for the arm. So if you go to compressionguru.com, they, um, you know, they'll, they'll show you what you can get from Juzo or what you can get from Medi or you can get from Jopes or you can get from Loman and Rauscher. I mean, they have all the different brands in one place. And I think they have pretty good prices. So um, check that out. My books are also on sale at compressionguru.com um, okay. uh, talking about keto um, for lymphatic disorders, stuff like that. So I mean, I think it's a good website and they, they um, it's it, when you're having to pay out of pocket, pay cash and not get your insurance to pay for it, then um, it, it can get really expensive. So he really tries to keep the, the prices down. It's, it's a very small company, you know, mom and pop type of company. So the only problem is I don't know how many listeners you have from around the world, um, but he doesn't ship out of the United States. So, um, but if you just um, look for on, you know, online shopping compression Velcro or something like that, then you'll probably come up with some other companies that do, um, you know, will ship to um, other countries and not just limited to the United States. How much apple cider vinegar is therapeutic? What uh, do you say, Todd? <laughs> I, I treat apple cider vinegar like I treat salt and I, I use it to taste. So like I add it to my oh. food. So I like, uh, if I'm making a, I'll take a chuck roast and put it in the slow cooker. I use apple cider vinegar in the broth and I put it and I make it add to taste. And it's really good because it it's a fat emulsifier. So it'll bond like the, the kettle and fire broth with the fat. So instead of the fat floating on top of the broth and it not being super pleasant to, to get that fat, it emulsifies it. And, and I like it because it makes kind of a gravy. It's got a good little kick to it. Um, when I'm having it on a steak or whatever, I just, you know, tend to get like vinegar based, um, simple hot sauce. So like I like Tabasco because it's just salt, a cayenne pepper and vinegar. And then I use that and I use it to taste. And that's basically how I get it in there. And I just noticed when I do that combination of vinegar and fat together and protein, I feel like a superhuman. Like I get crazy amounts of energy out of that. It's mm -hmm. so much better than any Red Bull. And I was a Red Bull and monster fiend when I was young, you know, mm -hmm. better than any of that by far. It's really good, clean energy. So, yeah. but I just do it to taste. So. Yeah. Beautiful. Have you heard of hawthorn? I've used leaves as tea and it helped me, it seemed, my circulation in my legs. I have not, you know, post your information about it. I have not heard of that. Um, there's a, a other supplements that um, anecdotally people are talking about that might help with uh, lymphatic disorders. Not a lot of whole, not research to back it up, um, but if you find something that works with you and it doesn't seem to cause you issues, but seems to help, 
Go for it. Never heard of it either. Regarding uh, checking with your doctor regarding supplements, most medical doctors in the U.S. at least are uh, hesitant to discuss anything beyond pharmaceutical treatments. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. It's true. Um, so uh, the, I have found they will discuss things that have an anticoagulant action. Specifically, I mean, if you have a procedure coming up, they will tell you, don't take vitamin E for two weeks prior to this. I mean, um, uh, don't take aspirin, you know, prior to this procedure. So they're talking about it in that um, context. And so um, I, I would still put it to them and say, hey, I, 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 I would like to experiment with this. Do you think if, if, if this has an anticoagulant action, this over-the-counter uh, supplement, is that bad, an interaction bad with any medication I'm taking? Your pharmacist will talk to you about it. That's their job is to know those interactions of, and, and whether it's over the counter or, um, or prescription. So if you don't feel comfortable talking to your doctor, talk to your pharmacist. That's a great point. Here we go. What exercise for the arms? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, I always start gentle, okay? Resistive exercises are gonna be the best, but you need to work up to them. And so, you know, just starting with, you know, simple open close, um, straighten your arms, bend your arms. Um, you might need to, to start with just lifting your shoulders up to shoulder height. Um, and, and, and when you can tolerate it, try to go higher above your shoulder. Think gentle to start out with, particularly if you've not been able to exercise for some time. Always start with diet, you're feeling better, then add some gentle exercise. Then eventually, I love to um, uh, have some kind of resistance. You see those TheraBands, those stretchy rubber band things. I love to um, mimic putting on compression stockings. So you loop that around your foot and then you pull <laughs> like that against the band around your foot. So it's like pulling up your stockings. And then when that gets easy, you might be able to get stockings on. <laughs> so. That's a good point. Yeah. Just don't hit yeah. yourself in the forehead. <laughs> no, <you're right>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, question. Don't care for apple cider vinegar. What about balsamic? Ooh, that's balsamic or not? All sugar. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. So it's that's why you like it because it, it's sweet. Right. <laughs> yeah. Too much sugar. You know, and this is a, this is a great point too. Like I have totally re you know, I have a totally different outlook on what, what it means to like something or not to like something, mm -hmm. because I thought that we have, <laughs> I don't know what I used to think. I guess I used to think we were born with taste buds and that's what we liked, but it is so not true. Mm -hmm. our, like as soon as our body finds out that we get a positive effect from something we're eating, you will learn to love that thing. Your body's going to give you cues to eat that thing. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause I, my taste buds have changed across the board. Things that I used to be addicted to. I can't stand now. Even the mm -hmm. smell of them puts me off yes. and things that when I was doing, I almost had an aversion to it. Now mm -hmm. I can't do without of it. I mean, I can literally drink apple cider vinegar. Now I crave it so much. Yes. Yes. So crazy. Mm -hmm. So, um, take your medicine for a little while and, it, and you'll start liking it. It's really yes. weird, but yes. I really truly believe that. So I, I do think that our taste changes. Um, I never found, you know, I'm so, so you're so used to having those yogurts that has a pile of sugar in there. Right. Yeah. And then plain yogurt, this has no taste, but eventually, I mean, I do fine with, with dairy. And so I have a, uh, some cream. It tastes sweet to me. <laughs> It tastes sweet. And if I have, um, you know, if I have some kind of vegetable caramelized onion, it's like too sweet, you know? Okay. So, um, so it's like a dessert. Um, exactly. so your, your taste does change on this way of eating. Yeah. And for the good, because it's so clean and so bright, like yes. all of a sudden, instead of just eating hyper palatable, like really just crazy blow your mind, you know, over the top, sweet, over the top spices yeah. and things. All of a sudden you can eat things and you can taste, you can taste all these nuances in the food, like the difference between browned butter and the skillet. You can taste all these crazy layers of flavor. And it's like, 
we've been so dead and down by MSG That's and all this. Yeah, stuff. all the additives. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's so crazy. I it's it, I don't know. I like we, we go into a restaurant now. And me and Lindy talk about this all the time. Most of the time, I can't eat because I can smell the putrid oil they're using in there, and I'm like, yes, yes, oh, so crazy. A mm -hmm. uh, question: Can the uh, lymphatic therapy be used if I have a pacemaker? Can a pacemaker patient use a vibration plates? No. So no <laughs> easy question, easy answer is that you, I've definitely worked at done um, lymphatic therapy on people who have a pacemaker. I cannot use, I have a, usually would have a variety of different modalities that would supply vibration. And I couldn't use any of those on someone who has a pacemaker, but there's so many other things I could use that it was okay. So no vibration, but yes to lymphatic therapy. Hey, Keith. Keith's got an awesome shout out to uh, Carnivore Keith New Zealand or NZ. Uh, we so need more health professionals like you, Leslie, Leslie and Keith. Have you seen changes in your profession? Yes. Um, so when I first started talking about nutrition in uh, maybe 2012, 2013, I was considered an oddball and I still am kind of, but, um, and I was the only one, if, if there was a lymphedema conference, I was there and I was talking about nutrition and I was the only one. And then I found out about like Dr. Gabrielle Fairber, who's been doing keto with her, um, lipedema patients for 15 years. And so there's isolated people out there, but now, Every single conference out there for lymphatic disorders, they're talking about nutrition. They never talked about it before. Um, and so, so that is an exciting transformation. It, well, I, I have to say, I have to take that back. I did go to a one conference where I was horrified because they were talking about make sure that you have um, uh, lots of fruits and vegetables and about 60% of your calories coming from uh, carbohydrates. Okay. That's when I knew that I had to, to do something because I mean, it was, I'm going, are you trying to give all of our patients diabetes? I mean, what are you talking about? Yeah. Um, so if, if, it, if it was talked about at all, it was that standard plant-based, low fat, low calorie um, way of eating that for some bizarre reason, we've come to believe that that is the healthy way to eat. Um, so but now every single conference, there's at least someone, not always me, that is talking about, you know, cutting down the carbs and eating healthy fats and getting plenty of protein is a good way to eat. We're just going to do this one quick again. Yeah, I do it to taste. I was going to, as I was looking at this question again, I was thinking too, you know, at first though, uh, it's kind of funny, right? People say, listen to your body, listen to your taste and all this. I'm like, well, when I first started this, my body was a crackhead. It wanted pizza and soda. So yes, yes. don't don't listen to that oh. signal. That's a bad signal. But once you get free, you know, once you uh, get free from the cravings and you've done this long enough, then you can really start listening to the cues from your body. And it's like a muscle. The more you do it, the more you can trust it. You know, mm -hmm. you do have to get to a point where your <laughs> your body's just not a, a drug addict looking for a fix and it yes. takes a minute. So yes. I would say if you're in that spot where none of it, you know, because it's not going to help you for me to tell you to have vinegar to taste if you're like, I hate all vinegar. So then I would say take as much as you can tolerate at first and work up to it. And then yes. when you start liking the taste of things that are good for you and not liking, you know, not having the cravings, you'll know you're kind of in that area where you can trust your your body's cues then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Question I had a uh, total knee replacement, right knee in 2011. So I did just, uh, so I, so did you just say a vibration plate is not good to use with having metal plate with, with a metal plate? That can be an issue. Look at the uh, product website and they will discuss that. Um, and they may say, well, make sure you just only use this setting or they may say blanket. If there's a metal plate, don't use, um, or they may say, um, uh, sit on it, don't stand on it. 
You know, what we don't want to happen is to shake that metal plate loose. OK, <laughs> this would not be good. So um, be very, very uh, careful and, and read the, the contraindications carefully. Don't invest in it. And then it turns out you can't even use it. Good advice. Uh, question, does ibuprofen have any effects on lymph fluid? Oh, this is this is a great question. There is currently underway a, a, a study at uh, Stanford University in California led by Dr. Stanley Roxon, and he is looking at a particular um, anti-inflammatory um, pharmaceutical and its impact on lymphedema. And they, um, they were, um, I think it was um, started out with you had to have lymphedema in one or both legs and um, you would go on this drug. And now they've opened it up also to arms and they've opened it up to lipedema patients as well. So um, if you um, put out on your search engine, uh, lymphedema, anti-inflammatory, Stanford, you're gonna come up with this study and they are still recruiting uh, participants if you were interested in that. Just so everybody knows, we're going to answer as many of these questions as we can, but we are going to, we're going to go for, we are at almost two hours and 38 minutes. So we will go uh, to just before the top of the hour here, and then we will, or we will kind of wrap up. So just want to let you know, we're going to get to it. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but this has been so popular. I'd love to do this again, do a round two sometime because everybody is absolutely loving this. Sure. And um, be, feel free to put out my email. Um, the one I like to use is Leslin Keith OT for occupational therapy. Leslin Keith OT at gmail.com. Feel free to email me. That'd be awesome. Yeah. And uh, we'll, I was going to go over one more time at the end. Michael's been putting your YouTube and your websites and stuff in, but we'll go ahead oh, and do it again you. at the end. Yeah. Much no better worries. at that than me, Michael. <laughs> Have you heard of castor oil uh, for reducing scarring? Definitely yeah, and also that. for reducing pain. Yes. Uh, people do use it for uh, pain and for scarring. Uh, I personally haven't used it, and I, I haven't uh, actually looked into it to see if there's any papers and research about it. Um, but it seems like, it, at the very least, it's benign, and it wouldn't be bad, um, and it may even be beneficial. So um, if you found, found benefit from it, I say go for it. Yeah, I use it by the case because that terrible, dry, hard skin yes. that was so hard yes. to get off, I yes. use it on that. And I, I found a little mini paint roller. It's about this wide, and I douse it up, and I roll it. I just, oh, I so does right. it have a long handle? A long it does. It has a long yeah. handle. It's like three foot long, but the roller is only that wide, yes. and it's about that big around. Yes, yes, yes. And I one use those, that. Yeah. One of those corner uh, uh, paint yeah. rollers. Yeah. Um, you know, these are the type of things that um, those kinds of little tidbits, Todd, um, when we share these with people, it really helps them because they're going, great, I want to put some castor oil on my foot and try it out. I can't reach my foot. You can't reach your foot, right. I know I couldn't get it to the back of my calves when I was first doing this. Now I can, thank the Lord, because carnivore worked. But at first I had to get that paint roller so I could reach yeah. the back of my calves and go around. Oh, use it, it on your back? Yeah. You know, yeah. that's... That's a great idea. Yeah, it works fantastic. So definitely recommend it. Um, let's see here. My brother, crazy enough as this sounds, but uh, he puts it in his eyes, right on his eyes. And it gets rid of uh, a bunch of inflammation and the floaters and stuff in his eyes. It's crazy. Interesting. Okay, don't yeah. try this at home. <laughs> yeah, I, it's There's people that do it a lot and it's pretty documented, but my brother okay. swears by it. Do so it at I, your yeah. friend's home. Yeah, and this is, by the way, I don't give medical advice. I keep getting in yeah. trouble for this because I yes. talk quick. I'm yeah. telling you experiences that I've witnessed and seen. Yes. I'm not telling yes. you to do anything. Exactly, exactly. So I just talk, but I'm not sitting, I'm, I'm no way an expert on anything other than experimenting on myself. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you for doing this. I'm getting answers to so many questions, as are we all. It is we are so happy you're here. It's incredible. 
Um, question, I don't know if I have lymphedema, but I have a significant uh, hanging belly apron. Uh, I also have a uh, clearly defined area on my abdomen where the skin is numb. Could you please, uh, could they be related? Um, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say that if you have a significant hanging belly apron, you have lymphedema um, and, and you have it in that apron, um, but it's likely you probably also have it in your legs. Um, and that numbness could very well be um, related. Um, I, and it's something that I always would document um, the sensation prior to starting treatment, and then we would monitor it as we um, continued. And I've definitely had people experience improved sensation once we've gotten the fluid out. Let's see, move on to this one. Is there anything in the blood test uh, that may be a warning uh, the lymphatics are having issues? Yeah, and so, um, and I don't know if you can um, share any of those slides with your um, with your audience, um, but yeah. I, I did have that one slide where we talked about, it is in the literature that um, people with central lymphatic dysfunction, just the central lymphatics, quite often have really high triglycerides. Um, and they have low copper and, you know, various other things on there. So there is some things on there, but as far as lymphatics in general, quite often, I mean, lymphedema and, and lipedema both are inflammatory conditions, chronic inflammatory conditions. So I'd also be looking for those elevated inflammatory markers like CRP. So um, that could, um, something that you would definitely want to check. That's good to know. I wonder you know, carnivore is such a, you know, anti-inflammation diet. I wonder, could you still have uh, inflammation? You know, like if you if you really had uh, a real lymphatic problem and you're having in, lymph, uh, inflammation markers still high, that might be something to look for too, wouldn't it? If you were on carnivore. Yes, yes. Um, and also you have to remember too that there's, uh, there's been a lot of stuff out there in the community about, um, I, I'm on carnivore. How come my glucose is still elevated? Um, uh, and that could be, and your inflammation markers could be still um, uh, elevated. And one thing they're looking at is you're feeling so good, you're exercising. And guess what? When you exercise, your glucose goes up and so does your uh, inflammation. Um, because it, inflammation is part of a natural process. It's that chronic inflammation that's bad. Um, your body is uh, becoming a little bit more metabolically flexible. So you're using glucose as well as fat for fuel. So um, keep in mind, you know, everything that's happening with you. And it's, it's not necessarily bad that um, you would have some increased inflammation or increased glucose if it's in the context of something that's healthy. Patient. Uh, my sister, uh, my sister has Hashimoto's and throat cancer. Uh, was wiggly shaped lymph nodes discovered during throat surgery? They removed two, then decided this must just be her normal. Any thoughts on the weird shape? I have not uh, heard of that strange shape. Um, but that's unfortunately, they removed 12 before they figured out that maybe these were all fine. Um, Cause that is, it does increase your risk for getting lymphedema, the more nodes that you remove. Um, but um, when you're talking about throat cancers, um, quite often um, we have, uh, the, the cancer has metastasized to the nodes and we have to, re to remove them. Different from some other cancers like breast cancer, it doesn't automatically metastasize. And that's why they've gone down to removing fewer nodes. And now those people who have fewer nodes removed, they have less chance of, of getting lymphedema. But if you are one of those people that had a, an impaired lymphatic system at birth, you know, you, you should have about 30 nodes under your arm, um, but maybe you're only born with eight. And now, well, they only removed two. Why did I get lymphedema? Well, because you only started with eight. So um, sometimes it's a combination of removing nodes and having an impairment already in the lymphatic system. So this, uh, your sister could have that weird shape, those weird shaped nodes that are just natural. And like they say, this is her normal. 
Leslie Keith, uh, you would make a great carnivore life coach. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. I think it's because of the name Keith. I think that's why. <laughs> uh, let's see. Question. Should we not use the skin test for dehydration? Oh, uh, okay. yeah. 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 This is a stay up. Like mine is right now. I need to drink some more. Mine's staying up. Um, but it, it, you can't do that skin lift on the area that you have lymphedema. Because remember we were talking about that you get the thickened skin. And one of the signs of lymphedema is what they call a, spot, a, a positive stem sign. You can't pinch it because it's so thick. Yeah. Then, then it said that is an indication that you have lymphedema. So um you'd have to be able to do it on a part of your body that doesn't have lymphedema in order to use that skin test. That makes a lot of sense. Um, question, are all four of you working with uh, with lymphedema? Does the doctor not suffer with it? Um, I, I, I think I have a venous condition. And so some, so I do wear stockings every once in a while, particularly when I fly. And so every once in a while I can, do, you know, press your thumb right against your shin and you hold it in for at least 10 seconds and you, it leaves a little depression, right? A nice little test to see if you're retaining water for whatever reason. Um, and I, I do get that in once in a while, um, but I, I am not diagnosed with lymphedema. Are all three of you, do you have any lymphedema issues? Yeah. 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 We're sure. all in the same boat when it's sinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, not anymore. We're plugging no, these yeah. holes. Yeah, we got a life raft. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're coming out of this. I'm feeling really good about it. You know, I was told I, I don't know what to believe anymore. And I understand that it that it won't, you know, that it's not gonna hundred percent heal. But I've been told all these things that won't heal, they don't get better. You just yes. gotta treat them with medicine. Mm -hmm. Like everything's healing up on this. I, I'm yes. questioning everything yes. that I've been told. Yes. You know? and, and this is I uh, one of my uh, partners, my colleagues that I work with, and we have a lifestyle program for people who have lymphedema and uh, and want to use a ketogenic diet um, uh, or a carnivore diet to help it. And my partner is saying, you know, we've been told forever that lymphedema is a chronic condition that's irreversible. You can make it smaller, you can make it better, but it's irreversible. And he said, I'm not so sure since he's, you know, been using diet in his practice with his patients, it may be that we can get a uh, reversible reversal on, on this condition. It feels like it. I mean, it, may, it might be a ways off, but I feel like, mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, I just think, you know, this is just me as a layman thinking, but I just think we haven't been trying because we've been led such a stray to believe this big food, big pharma system has to be the way that mm -hmm. nobody's been even looking at this enough, right. you know, and to thank people right. like you and people just finally seeing through the, the money system that, that is big pharma, people are starting to do this now. And I think once we, you know, once it starts going in that direction, who the heck knows what we might figure out, you know? Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Yep. Um, uh, do you think that AFib has anything to do with the lymphatic system at all? Wanda, what a wonderful question. And we can spend the whole next episode talking about <laughs> that. Um, so your, your heart actually has specialized lymphatics. Matter of fact, um, all of your organs have lymphatics that are specialized just for that organ. And uh, Dr. Stanley Roxon, the, the uh, researcher that's doing that anti-inflammatory drug research on lymphedema, he made this comment at a past lymphedema conference. He said, the lymphatics are so important to our overall health that in the future, many chronic conditions we're going to treat by treating the lymphatics. So, yes, I do believe it has a big impact on AFib. That's um, awesome. Well, we know what to talk about in our next episode whenever we can line that up. That'll be an, <laughs> incredible. Um, Todd, do you fast every week or are you eating less after fasting? So, I do fast every week unless my body tells me I'm not ready for it. I, I do listen to that now. I used to force it. I do not force it anymore. That just ruins your metabolism. I don't uh, ever recommend that. So, uh, so really I'd say about 75% of the time I do it every week, but about every 25% of the time, my body's still hungry and it's wanting nourishment. Yes. So I listen to it. I no longer 
go against that. Mm -hmm. That's the old way of thinking for me, where I was just going to stubborn through everything and make things worse. Mm -hmm. So I'm really trying not to do that anymore. Um, let's see. And then, yeah, the food is the same way. Uh, I, I am overall eating a lot less for sure. It's crazy. But it, when you fast, it's like you get really efficient at uh, burning fat as fuel. You know, you get very fat adapt. And then your body just takes over and you just naturally eat less. You naturally need less. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, I have cellulitis in both legs. They both are uh, pretty deformed from lymphedema uh, and the infections. I am going, uh, I am doing the right thing by using the vibration machine question. Anything else I can do? Yeah, your diet. <laughs> and, and I really think that even before I would use the vibration, uh, particularly when you have cellulitis, if you're in the hospital with your cellulitis, you need to have access to real food and not what they give you in most hospitals. So you, you've got to cut the carbs. You've got to get plenty of meat. Um, and so um, and that is going to give your body the nutrients it needs to heal from the infections. Once you're out of the hospital, or maybe you're, you're handling your cellulitis at home, um, but once you're over the infection, then, um, then you can add things like vibration. But if you don't have the diet, nothing else is going to work as well. Sure. And I mean, that is such good advice and so true because, you know, all my life, everybody's like, take these vitamins and that's the answer and take this thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you eat these vegetables, it's going to help. Well, who the heck would have known if they were good or bad with that, with a bad diet, your, your body is a dumpster fire and you could, mm -hmm. your body, you have no idea what anything's doing. That's why carnivores and elimination diet is so powerful. Yes. Without doing that elimination, I wouldn't even know. I can't even handle black pepper. Who would have ever thought black pepper was a problem? It's, you know, it's a and nice thing. Yeah, yeah. It was it was causing me. Uh, it made my lungs sound like bagpipes just for a little yeah. shake of black pepper. Yeah, you know, like wheezing, terrible. Mm -hmm. Once we actually see, we for ourselves, we don't have to listen to any of the nonsense white noise out there. We can figure out for ourselves what's poisoning us. Right. And there's nothing more powerful, in my opinion, than that, that, or for me, that's been more powerful than that. Just knowing I don't care what paper was written to say this is good. <laughs> if you can't breathe, it's bad for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't don't so, eat it. You know, and so that's the beauty of it. That, all. You know, that sounds like what Georgia E just said. Um, Dr. Georgia E, you know, that she does the metabolic psychiatry. Mm -hmm. And she said, through research, we now know that the head is connected to the body. Exactly. <laughs> well, uh, watch end is the question. I know a few doctors, I would say it's connected to the rear end. <laughs> uh, thank you, Todd, Michael, Linda, Linda, and Dr. Leslie Keith for the information. I no longer feel alone. You've helped a lot uh, with my concerns. I look forward to the next session. Appreciate yeah, me too. It. And you might you might have to get it. You might have to use the back door to get out of here, Leslin. Holly <laughs> says we should keep her. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I I feel like you guys have all done me a huge favor because I love talking about this. And the people that I live with get real tired of hearing it. So, so thank you so much for giving me an outlet oh, <laughs> and letting me talk about it. I, we appreciate yeah, it. And you can, we, do. we will not get tired here. Uh, Carnivore Scott, shout out. He's got an awesome channel. Go check out Carnivore Scott. Mm -hmm. I'm late to the show. I have uh, grade three plus edema in my lower leg. Mm -hmm. What is the best exercise to get fluid up and out of the lower leg? Yeah. Um, well, first you're already doing the carnivore. So that's good. We start with that. And then um, that, that uh, muscle pump, your calf is going to be the best thing. And that's why I'm kind of loving the, the rebounder and to just do that gentle bouncing because um, it just makes your calf muscle really pump. And then um, using elevation, if you still have the flexibility and you're able to do this, I mean, people talk about getting a leg up the wall, um, so or if you're under your, on your bed and you can put your legs on the headboard um, and getting them really elevated and then you do some ankle pumps, you got elevation plus the muscle exercise. 
Um, and, and, and Scott, I don't know what um, your a level of ability is with how much you're able to move and exercise, but anything that gets that calf muscle pumping, and it could be as gentle as uh, what Mike was talking about with just being in your recliner and pointing and flexing your ankle, or it could be, you know, doing some, uh, you know, everything to, to, to running, you know, so that calf muscle pump is a super powerful return of that fluid. One more question here. I got in on my phone says, uh, how do I tell if I have lymphedema cellulite or cellulite or, or I'm just plain fat. Mm -hmm. So lipedema has a cluster of symptoms. You have that abnormal deposition of fat in the lower body. So it, sometimes it's hard to tell if you're obese, if abdominal obesity along with it, but you have a smaller upper body, large, larger lower body. And um, uh, if you, for instance, if you had bariatric surgery and you got really skinny through the head and neck and trunk, but your arms and legs didn't change at all, you probably have lipedema, but it also has easy bruising. It has um, the feet and hands are not affected unless you get lymphedema in addition, and then you will have swelling there. But if it's just the fat, the hands and feet are not affected. It's painful. And so even a gentle touch causes a pain. But if you're on carnivore or keto, you've gotten rid of that pain. So you may not have that pain. That, that happens even before you lose weight and lose fat. The pain goes away when you remove the inflammation from your diet. But look for those cluster of symptoms, that um, disproportion and the pain, the easy bruising, and the hands and feet are not affected. That was the last question. We got a few comments saying uh, nice things. Uh, I'd love to have you come back and do more. Charlie says, thank you all for your time. We appreciate you, Charlie. Thanks for you guys watching and supporting the channel. Um, uh, I have four pages of notes. This is the best thing ever. So <laughs> there we go. Thank you all so much. This was a great, a great time. I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much. Now, can you tell everybody how we can support you? Where do we send people? How do we, uh, how do we find you? Oh, well, um, you can come to my website at leslinkeith.com. Um, email me, leslinkeithot at gmail.com. I have a program that I did with another occupational therapist, uh, Lymphatic Lifestyle Solutions, and we promote a ketogenic diet. A lot of people on our group are, are doing carnivore. Um, uh, if you have questions about lipedema in particular, contact me there at leslin at lipedemaproject.org. Michael's putting all these in the chat right now. If you guys would click on them, bookmark those and save them uh, so you guys can visit them. Definitely check out her YouTube channel and go give it a subscribe, uh, subscribe to her YouTube channel. Give it a thumbs up, spread the word, share it with people. We'd sure appreciate it. And man, you guys are awesome. You guys hang out with us the whole three hours. Incredible crowd tonight. We sure, and we sure appreciate it. Made it the whole time, too. Leslin, <laughs> Leslin's a trooper. As soon I as mean, I sign off, I'm going to go eat my steak. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Well, we're going to sign off here. And then if you want to stick around for one more second uh, uh, so we can say goodbye to you and mm -hmm. wrap it up. Sure. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, guys.